Okay, good morning, everybody. We're going to get started. No, I'm not muted. You can hear me. All right. I will. Yeah. Okay, so we um, welcome everybody here in person at Puyallup Research and Extension Center. My name is Doug Collins. And we're, um, you can see up on the screen uh, that we also have some other guests joining us from the hinterland. So we're doing kind of a combined webinar in person. Um, this is the first annual Cover Crop Roundtable. So we have big intentions of doing this again. Um, I really want to thank Allie Nichols and the Pierce Conservation District for spearheading this and, and uh, making this happen. So we, again, we are uh, doing this um, online as well. So hopefully that won't create any problems and will actually you know, allow us to share more information with more people that couldn't make it. So those of you that are online, um, we have somebody monitoring the chat window and you can let us know if things aren't working out and we'll try to um, fix that. So this morning, I am going to kick things off with a quick talk about some of the research we've been doing. And then we have Justin O'Day, who's here, and he's, gonna, um, he's also with WSU down in uh, Vancouver. And Justin, you've been with WSU for through two years? Well, a year and a half. Yeah, so but Justin's got a, a, a lot of experience. We snagged him from Cornell, where he was working with Extension. Um, so he will talk about um, brassica cover crops. And then we'll have lunch. Um, for those of you online, we'll follow a strict uh, time schedule and let you go get some lunch as well. And uh, we'll come back very excited for um, a farmer panel this afternoon. And there's also a lot of knowledge in the room. Um, and so we have uh, some microphones and we wanna make sure that if somebody has a question, we are able to get that question captured for our online audience. And that goes for the panel. And then also if there's any um, kind of announcements, we have uh, some NRCS professionals here today and, and they've got some programs that we'd like to touch on as well. All right. Okay, so again, I'm Doug, and I'm going to talk about the, um, some recent uh, cover crop research we have going on here, and certainly I'm not trying to capture everything that we've done. I'm really focusing kind of on the stuff that's in the ground right now, and um, that brings me to another point I wanted to talk about. So we have a pretty an, a experiment I'm excited about um, on farm at Four Elements Farm here in Puyallup. I don't see Amy here today but uh, Amy Sills and um, Augustine Moreno is a uh, farmers out there. And so that's uh, down the road about 10 miles. Um, and we kind of repeated some of that trial, not the full trial, but um, most of it here at our station. And so that's across the street when we're all done today. If anybody wants to kind of meander out there and look at some cover crops, we put up some signs um, indicating uh, the plot. So the same cover crops that I'll talk about and I, I took some pictures out at Four Elements. So those same cover crops are planted here. Um, with a, there's a little more complexity out at Four Elements that I'll talk about. And then uh, also about the Western Cover Crop Council, which we're just starting and kind of excited to share information about that. And it's more, more mainly a sort of stay tuned announcement, but uh, we will bring you into the loop early. Okay, this, uh, the New York Times Magazine, I don't know if anybody saw this article, it was uh, February 6, 2016. Did anybody have a chance to see that? Um, so cover crops are big time. You guys are in the, the New York Times Magazine. So I was um, excited to see this. I, when I talk about cover crops to beginner farmer audiences, I always mention it as a, 
a gift to the soil, but I'm, uh, I'm not a writer for the New York Times and they spend a little more time, you know, thinking about good, or good analogies. So I like this, um, fields of non-cash crops like hairy vetch and cereal rye that act on soil like a nourishing facial after the harvest. So, <laughs> um, and there's, it's a, it's a good article. Another one I liked out there, you know, they, it's mainly in the Midwest they're talking about, and I'm not going to repeat all the numbers, but they're talking about just massive increases in cover crop acreage, which is a good thing. And, um, but there's still resistance to change. Farmers are notoriously reluctant to offer their neighbors advice about farming and cover cropping carries within an implicit criticism of practices reliance on fertilizers and pesticides and so forth that farmers for the last generation have used to increase productivity and reduce work. So not a lot, you know, there's the number of acres under cover crop are increasing, but we know there's still, you know, most of agriculture is not kind of relying on that biointensive practice to provide nutrients and build soil. They're relying on uh, commercial fertilizers and pesticides. So it can be touchy in some circles, you know, what are you doing over the fence? And that doesn't look very good. And, um, but so the article talks a little bit about those conversations and that's the kind of thing we can talk about today. I don't think we have that kind of stigma necessarily um, here in this group, but uh, there's, you know, what works one place is, is that's the kind of information we really want to share and that we're trying to do with our research. So we have focused a lot in our research on um, reduced tillage, organic agriculture, sort of a cover crop intensive method and, and our big goal with that research has been to grow a mulch in place, if you will. So we focused on how are we going to terminate that, that mulch. Um, and so uh, without herbicides or tillage. So when you use cover crops, this is again, a non cash crop. So you want that cover crop to not be hanging around necessarily when you're trying to grow your cash crop. Uh, so we focused in our research on, on how do we kill this stuff um, without uh, herbicides or um, tillage. And as you'll see, what, what works well is you basically have to wait for these, whether it's a vetch or a cereal, you have to wait for these cover crops to switch into that flowering phase. So through this research, we spent a lot of time looking at, at the development of cover crops and when do they, reach these sort of magical uh, stages where we can um, terminate them with a mower or a roller crimper. So that's one thing that we focused on, the maturation that, that's also called phenology, um, sort of the, the life cycle of the crop. And, and, and we find that different crops reach those um, key points at different uh, calendar dates or different degree, growing degree day accumulations. And then the other thing, of course, we were looking for is high biomass. You can see our colleague Andy Berry there in amongst some aroostic rye. And we like aroostic rye, that'll come back around uh, later today. And so um, what, what we were looking at was uh, research in organic um, corn and soybeans, and, and there's been a lot of use with a roller crimper. So that was one mechanism that we examined for uh, terminating cover crops, and then the other was flail mowing. And um, this is uh, the Zadox scale or the Feeks and Han scales, basically different scales to determine the same thing. We use the Zadox scale. Um, so zero on the scale is your seed that's just germinating and 100 is your plant that's finished its life cycle and it's got new seeds inside of it. So you can use a number value to basically track um, that development. And you can't read this, but you've got um, like elongation, um, till, tillering happening in here, and then elongation, um, boot in this stage, and then flowering over here, and then um, maturation. So this is not necessarily related to no-till. This is just kind of your management of a grain cover crop in a, in a tilled system. Um, there's a lot of research uh, done here and at Oregon State University looking at that carbon to nitrogen ratio of grains as they mature. And what you're trying to manage for if your intention is to till that cover crop in is to terminate it for one, but also to not put, a, sort of create an imbalance of carbon and nitrogen in the soil. So 
if as, as the crop is maturing, what we see, this is with grain crops, we see that carbon to nitrogen ratio going down as it gets into these flowering and um, mature stages. So if you um, terminate it way back here and then till that into the ground, you're likely gonna tie up nitrogen uh, temporarily. So this stem elongation is the best time um, to incorporate grain cover crops um, in a tilled situation. And there's some leeway there. Um, you know, the, the percent, you're still likely uh, to get some nitrogen from that crop. So these aren't legumes, obviously. Um, legumes, you know, we have this ability to take nitrogen from the atmosphere and they're gonna be kind of adding nitrogen to the soil that wasn't there before. But what a grain cover crop can do is scavenge nitrogen from the soil in the fall, bring that into its, into its um, body and kind of carry that over um, into the spring. So there is nitrogen in these crops and if you terminate them um, here, you can, get, you can get a little bit of nitrogen or at least be neutral, not tying up nitrogen as that material decomposes. Looking at this um, reduced tillage, what we found is anthesis is another word for um, pollination. Um, and we found that if you're mowing the crop, you can um, do that very early in anthesis. So the crop is gonna kind of switch from some point to what we would call the vegetative growth to this flowering stage. And once that head comes out and it's starting to think about pollen, you can mow that crop and you're not gonna see significant regrowth. If you come out and just mow the crop in this stage, it's gonna regrow. You haven't killed the crop. You know, you're gonna cut off everything above ground, but then it's gonna grow again. It's gonna give it another shot. But when it gets to this um, anthesis stage, even the early anthesis, it will um, not grow back. And so mowing is a good way to terminate um, at that stage. Okay, let me repeat that question. Um, we had a question here. So the question is, uh, if we terminate the crop um, at anthesis, okay, we terminate, well, it shouldn't regrow, so maybe before. Yeah, so it, it, like right before, maybe uh, in boot or um, in that area. You know, once it's in boot, I don't know that we have that kind of like detailed, will it grow um, at that stage. The regrowth is gonna be less, I would say, as you get you know, further away from, from this stage. Um, and then the question is, what would the carbon to nitrogen ratio be? I don't know the exact answer. I wanna say that it would probably be a little bit higher than the original flush, but I don't, I don't have good data on that. I mean, I know that you know, when we get to this elongation and flowering, um, you know, it changes considerably. It gets, you can just see that woodiness of it. So I think some of it you can almost tell just by the material itself. Like if it's getting to be woody and stiff, you know that C to N ratio is gonna be wide. Wide C to N ratio means less carbon per, or less nitrogen per carbon. Um, we've also experimented with the roller crimper. And um, we have found that if you do kind of late anthesis, um, it will stay down with one rolling and we haven't done a lot. We, we tried an experiment last year with some multiple rolling, but we didn't get, we didn't get great data off of that. Um, but if you roll it at late anthesis, it'll stay down. It'll, you know, it'll successfully be knocked down and it'll stay there. But in, in our experience, and I, you know, you can see different things in the literature and, and it's kind of a hard thing to, to look at and some people just don't care, but um, this, this question of, are you still going to get seed developed? And in our experience, the answer would be yes. You know, so if you're waiting long enough for the crop to, to pollinate and then you knock it down, you're likely getting seed heads. We have kind of wet <laughs> soil in the spring and I mean, it's going to vary from soil type, but, um, maybe even get a June rain or a late May rain. So what the roller crimper is doing is, is basically interfering with that xylem, the plant uptake of water. And if you've got so much water in the soil and it's kind of a happy environment for a grass, it's kind of hard to really 
terminate it and kill it. So it'll stay down, but the seed will go on and develop in our experience. Um, what I would say, like if you were intent on using the roller crimper, I would probably hit it early and often. And so talking to farmers that do use roller crimpers, they will frequently, you know, roll it in this area or even here first. And then they find that it starts to come back up and then they go out and roll it again. So, you know, you're making more passes, but if you're really um, trying to prevent seed production, that would, that would probably be my, my advice. If you don't care about seed production, like if all you grow is vegetables, it may not be a big deal to have some rye seed um, being developed there. Um, cereal rye is a noxious weed in some counties, so <laughs> um, that's another thing to keep track of uh, if you're doing an experiment in the Columbia Basin. Okay, vetch. Um, so that's the scale. This scale is pretty well known, and you know, again, Zadox, Feex, Hahn. Um, this has been around for a long time. Um, this uh, vetch scale that we use is derived from a paper. Um, Mishler at all in 2010, and I can't remember where he is. I want to say Michigan, but I could be wrong. Um, so they came up with the scale. They were doing similar research, organic reduced tillage, trying to kill cover crops. And so they got pretty um, detailed in terms of how they're going to say what scale, what stage is this vetch at? And so of course, you've got the vegetative stage and that just means no flowers. And then you're basically counting the number of flowers um, until here you can see some seed pods, the early pod set, and then the final stage there would be late pod. Um, vetch can be a problem if, you, if it goes to seed. And so we're, we were certainly not interested in um, doing that. We've had that happen in our fields before. Um, and you can tell where that happened, you know. <laughs> so uh, it's something to be uh, aware of. Um, and so what we found is that when it makes that switch to flowering, we can get pretty good consistent control with mowing. And um, in other climates, we see reported control with rolling crimping um, at around that early pod set. Does not work very well here. So when we've waited again and then rolled, you know, even as late as early pod set, we're basically setting up a situation for um, seed production. One of the things that could be happening, so again, when they're doing on bigger farms, when they're doing no-tilled corn or soybeans, they're often rolling with the roller in front and then they have a no-till drill that they're dragging behind at the same time. And so Pierce Conservation District has a no-till drill now, which we're excited about. So we did do an experiment last year where we, um, and, and in some conversations with farmers I've had, they, they mentioned this, that if actually, you know, it could be not necessarily the roller, but the drill behind that's really slicing that vetch and, um, and terminating it. So um, this looks pretty weedy, obviously, but we um, terminated this uh, probably four weeks earlier. And so here you can see the, the um, path of the uh, drill through here. And, you know, it looked a lot better two weeks after before the weeds started to come through. But the, the vetch, you know, what you don't see over here is a lot of vetch, whereas over here, this was just the roller crimper alone um, at, done at the same time. So dragging that no-till drill, I think there's, there's definitely promise there for people that are, that are interested in this. Yes? This would have been at um, probably like 40% uh, flower. And so that it's, I mean, all you really need to do is cut it uh, once. And Justin may talk a little bit more about that. But um, if you, if you're, and, and so I think, you know, one thing that could work here even better would be to roll in one direction and then come back and bring a drill through in the other direction. And that would certainly be like good termination. Yes. Why not just two? I, tried that a couple of years ago I and mean, maybe you know somebody could probably do it better than I did it um, a lot of weight you would have to basically emulate what's going on in that no-till drill where they have really sharp coulters a lot of weight a lot of down pressure and that coulter slicing the um, the foliage so it's not impossible perhaps with a with a disc have you tried going different directions but 
one way and then drill the other way? No, I, I, I mentioned that would, be, I, that would be the way to do it. Yeah, I think if you did that, you would get more 100% control because some of the stuff that is growing here was likely not sliced because it just kind of rolled and then this, you know, it, it's easy to get it rolled in one direction and then not cut by the drill. So, um, okay, sorry, I didn't, re there was a question about, uh, what about a drill, would that work instead of a, um, a no-till, or what about a disc, would that work instead of a no-till drill? We did try that back a couple years ago, and I, we just couldn't, we, we put some weight on there, but we just couldn't get the disc to really cut the material, whereas this no-till drill, like, no problem, so. Okay, um, going to talk about this experiment that I'm pretty, in, well, maybe any questions on the no-till stuff before I switch gears? Yes. The question is, you talk about the ideal carbon to nitrogen ratio, what are we shooting for? So we talk about C to N ratios a lot with, um, compost and things like that. With cover crops, we tend to talk more about percent nitrogen and they're, they're related. So um, when you're at about high ones, getting to close to 2%, then you're, you're likely to have nitrogen made available. You know, vetches are gonna be two to 3% nitrogen. And that rye is gonna go from high, high one to two down to one or less than one. So um, one and a half would certainly be kind of a, a worrying um, level for me. And uh, there's a good pub um, from Dan Sullivan and Nick Andrews at Oregon State just about this whole subject. So I would recommend that. They might have the numbers in there. But I think it's around one and a half, you know, percent is where you're kind of maybe the, the breaking point. So if you go below that in terms of nitrogen content, you're likely to tie up nitrogen. Above that, you're likely to make it available. And certainly around two or three percent. That's a lot of likely a lot of available nitrogen. Any any questions from the hinterland? Can you repeat the author of that short Yes, Dan Sullivan and Nick Andrews. Um, can't remember the title. In the resource list. Okay. I'm gonna go on then, just talk about the experiment that we have going on out at, um... oh wait, hold on, back up. I'm not quite to four elements yet. This is a little more related to the no-till stuff. So we, um, <clears throat> we really wanted to look at this issue of the timing of maturation. And so we did an experiment um, at seven, well, six different farms and Puyallup to uh, basically we chose carefully some um, species that we thought would have different um, maturation timing. So we wanted to just kind of show this, this concept that some species are going to be, or some varieties are going to be faster than others. So we used common vetch and hairy vetch, and then we used a rustic rye, and then um, bobtail rye in the western Washington farms, and then, or sorry, bobtail wheat in the western Washington farms, and then Farnham wheat, and um, we had one eastern Washington farm, Cloudview Eco Farm. So this was a good opportunity to also just put a lot of cover crops on different farms, same cover crops, same planting dates. The, the way they were planted is gonna be different because everybody used their own equipment. Some people actually broadcast the material too. So we broadcast at a little bit higher rate and then we drilled it at the, um, if they were using a drill, we used the same rate for that. So you can see here, um, this is the development of the two different um, rise, or sorry, the two different uh, grains on this, uh, in these graphs here, kind of in the way, but. Um, oh, here we go. So wheat is yellow and a rustic rye is gray. And so just looking at the Puyallup data here, we had a little more, um, you know, fine detail, but you can see pretty much the same pattern at the on-farm sites. Uh, there's this time, um, this gap between heading. So say, say your intention was to incorporate the cover crop, you can sort of decide when do I think I want to do that incorporation and your choice of cover crop can really work to your benefit there. Because what you don't want to do is be in a situation where I don't really want to incorporate that cover crop until May 
and you plant some very early maturing variety and now you've got something that's out there just going to seed um, and, and you can't really get out there or you're not really ready to get out there and do that. So you can see the um, wheat, winter wheat was a lot slower in terms of its development. So while the aroostook rye is just taking off and going into heading and stuff, which if you're gonna do the no-till, that might be a, um, desirable, but for incorporation, that's um, probably not working in your favor. And then for the vetch, we did common vetch and hairy vetch, and you can see that um, the uh, common vetch is much earlier than the hairy vetch. So one of the cool things that we discovered with vetches while we were um, playing around with termination timing is that we, we were able to let these vetches go. You know, when a lot of people, when they see that first flower, it's like panic, get out there, mow it, um, you know, kill it. And we've been able to see that there's this pretty long flowering period, you know, before you start to see um, pod. So you actually do have some time um, to play around with in, in terms of that. I don't have this seed in, I don't have the percent nitrogen data on um, these crops yet. Uh, it, it'll be interesting. I, you know, sometimes you can see a bit of a decrease if you wait till those late flowering stages. Um, but not always. Some of the data I've seen, we, we got pretty good percent nitrogen at, at late flowering as well. So here you can see there's a gap between potential seed production. So this um, common vetch up here, you're going to start to be nervous about seed production mid-May, whereas with hairy vetch, um, much less nervous, you know, at that same time period until sort of mid-June would that hairy vetch be starting to put on seed. And we saw some differences in biomass. Um, a rustic was better in most cases, but, but not all. Now, and this is the early, so at this, at, we did an early and a late termination. Um, so you can see in some farms, there's a huge change uh, in terms of the biomass when you do that early termination versus the late. And so the early for this experiment the early was going to be around this, um, you know, elongation, like the time that you would want to incorporate it. And then late was going to be more around um, pollination. So you can see there's in some farms, there's a huge increase in biomass In other ones. It's not that, not that distinct of an increase in biomass. And then um, with vetch, the hairy vetch did a lot better at, at pretty much every farm site. And you can see that increase in biomass. And so this is what I was talking about this benefit here. Um, of going from like 4,000 dry pounds per acre to um, 7,600 just by waiting on that hairy vetch, not going out and mowing it right away. So if you think about the total pounds of nitrogen that you're putting into the soil, that's going to be that percent nitrogen times the biomass. And the, in our experience, my experience, the percent nitrogen does not really change that much. Like you're certainly coming out ahead um, if you're incorporating it at that later stage if you can just see it keep growing. Okay, so this is actually on my, in my office, my, my wish list. So sort of getting into the, uh, the cover crop council and, and, you know, just our interest in cover crop research in general. You know, some of the things that um, I, I, I would say I don't have on this list necessarily like the importance of phenology and no-till. Like I think we've kind of worked on that quite a bit, um, but there's all these other questions that are still out there. Um, fertility, when we're planting the cover crop, um, what rate, you know, we certainly have some rates that we go to and you're like, why do we use that rate? You know, you can't necessarily figure it out. Um, some people use higher rates in organic. Should we be using higher rates? If like weeds are our number one pernicious issue, should we, you know, could a higher rate um, help with that? Um, Seedbed prep, we've looked at that quite a bit. Now we've got this no-till drill can we get around away with lighter tillage when we're planting those cover crops and still get a good cover crop? Um, false seed beds, um, putting a little more effort into getting a really clean um, cover crop. Uh, water, you know, here um, we have a very dry season in the summer and that's, uh, you get to late summer, you're, you're wanting to put down a cover crop. Um, is it worth irrigating it? Um, and date, that's, uh, that's something as well. When, you know, how late can we plant it? What are the benefits and how do those change? with different um, varieties. So I'm excited about this trial at um, four elements in here. We were able to look at least at this um, fertility question. So at um, four elements, um, and again, this is 
thanks to the Pierce Conservation District for helping to fund this research. Um, so we're using a couple of things that we're doing here that we haven't necessarily always done in the past, um, using named cover crop varieties. And as the, with the Cover Crop Council, that's something that we're very intent on pushing. Um, we did an experiment with and without compost. Uh, you know, if your soil is, is sort of in bad shape, um, are there, can you even grow a cover crop? You know, I've got that question. My, my soil's so bad, I, I tried to grow a cover crop in order to improve the soil and I got like nothing growing. So, you know, what benefit do you get from, um, from applying compost and a cover crop? And then we used um, fertilizer. So again, if your soil is like in really bad shape and there's no fertility there, that doesn't mean that this cover crop is just gonna take off and grow and fix everything. In order to get the benefits of the carbon from the cover crop, you might have to provide a little bit of fertilizer. And then the other thing um, we did is do um, targeted uh, seeds per square foot. So with our rise, we've typically been like 100 pounds per acre, you know, but um, there's a little more sophisticated approach to it uh, in terms of thinking about how many, what's your target um, number of seeds per square foot. And that's gonna be the seeds of different sizes. You'll end up with different rates uh, in terms of, of the pounds you apply. So what we looked at <clears throat> for vetches, we had a hairy vetch, a common vetch, and a woolly pod vetch. Um, purple bounty, Languedoc, I just love that one. Um, and Lana vetch. And then clovers, uh, Bersim frosty, and Balanza clover fixation. And these are um, clover varieties that come from grassland Oregon. Uh, they've bred them, I believe. And um, you can buy them in different places, but uh, these are sort of varieties that have been developed and, and that's kind of exciting where people are putting a little more attention into cover crop seeds. These are the two clovers, yeah. No, frosty and fixation. And then for grains, we've got our good friend Aroostook, which we've used that for years in our reduced till work. It puts on great biomass, it's very early. Um, Rinza bruzi. Um, this is one, the, um, what's it called? The Plant Material Center in Corvallis. Um, so um, Grassland Oregon uh, put on a big tour earlier this, uh, let's see, last fall, summer. And um, one of the stops on there was a Plant Material Center in, in Corvallis. Um, and very thankful to the folks there for their research they've done. And they're part of a, a sort of national uh, study looking at cover crops. So, um, you know, for example, the idea of using targeted seeds per square foot came from their work. That's how they decided on their rates. And then what, what we did is look at their results. So Corvallis is kind of the closest one to our climate here. Um, and Rinza Bruzi was one that did well there. And then we also tried oats. And they're also monitoring phenology. In hindsight, I would have maybe not gone necessarily for the one that they did that had the highest biomass, but I might've looked at if they had one that was a little bit later, but that kind of occurred to me, you know, after the seeds were in the ground. So uh, next time. Um, but Renza Bruzi, it turns out, I looked into that later. I love that name as well. Um, and that one is, is likely to be a very early maturing variety as well. So probably similar to the Aroostook. So we seeded on September 24th, 2008. Um, the grains were at 42 um, seeds per square foot, um, vetches seven seeds per square foot, and then the bursim at 57 and the balance at 26. I'm not sure why there's a different, um, but that's, that's, what, that's the Grassland Oregon recommendation for um, the seeds per square foot that you wanna target um, for those different crops. So we went with that. Okay, this is one of the reps out at um, Four Elements. So just to, the cool thing you can see here, we got all the crops in a row. Um, all of these crops in, in this area, we first applied compost um, to, the, to the field. So we spread compost first, no compost here. And then we took each plot, and these are 30 feet long, and I'll show you some pictures. So each plot here, we randomly chose half the plot to receive fertilizer. So we have this compost, fertilizer, and cover crop variety trial all built into one. And again, this is just one, one replication 
um, and there's four of them. So across the street later today, at the, when we're all done, if you're interested, you can see um, essentially the, this side of the, we, don't, we didn't do the compost part of the trial here, but we did the fertilizer and uh, no fertilizer trial. So you can take a look at that. Oops. Okay, so looking at that fertilizer, so this is one of the compost trials. Um, this is the Cossack black oat, and this line right here is about where the fertilizer was applied up front, and then no fertilizer here. And I just sort of put my camera up over that, and you can see the benefit of, of that fertilizer. So, you know, a lot more ground showing, a lot more potential for weeds. As we look at some of the clovers and, and vetches, this still looks pretty good up here, um, but look at how dense dense that is um, with just 30 pounds of nitrogen, you know, not very much um, fertilizer. And we'll do soil testing and stuff as well, but, you know, in theory, we're not going to be losing that nitrogen. We're, we're, the plant is going to take that nitrogen, carry it over into the spring. So it's kind of money in the bank um, going forward. And we'll, we'll check that with our soil testing. But. Um, we did not inoculate uh, our vetches. There's lots of vetch growing out there, um, or our clover. Well, the clovers, I think, come, the f they come all kind of like from grassland. Uh, the fixation, I know, comes with its own inoculant. Um, so there's good nodulation happening. I just dug up a couple plants, um, nice, beautiful nodules, um, doing their thing in the vetch and these clover. And, and even the purple bounty, um, which you'll see, was not growing very densely. Um, it, the ones that were growing were, were doing a good job in terms of nodulation and, and growth. So the, um, the L species are looking really good, the Languedoc and the Lana, and I think this pretty much reflects uh, what's going on here at Puyallup as well. You can go and check that out. Um, and the purple bounty, not so much. You got to look pretty hard to see a, a purple bounty um, hairy vetch plant okay. in that. So somebody's asking what the question is what fertilizer did we use? And so those were only used on the um, grains. We use a uh, feather meal um, fertilizer. So 30 pounds of in, and that would be an 1100 product. What if any soil testing was done and what was the target you wanted pre-planting? What if any soil testing was done and what was the target pre-planting? We did a general soil test. Um, we looked at basically phosphorus, nitrogen, pH, everything looked pretty good. Um, the, then we applied the compost, <clears throat> we applied that fall. So this is a little bit, you know, as a soil scientist and, and looking out for the environment and everything, applying materials like that in the fall is a little bit risky. And so, you know, we're, we're going to monitor this, monitor this carefully. So we applied those materials before plant and then we came back about four weeks later. So we hadn't gotten a lot of rain or anything. We wouldn't have lost a lot of nitrogen at that point. And we did sampling. So you would have time for the mineralization to occur. Um, and I don't have those, do, those data yet. They're sitting in a soil dryer. But that'll be part of the field day at Four Elements in the spring. We can share that sort of the bigger story with you there. Because yeah, we don't want to put down fertilizer and then see it just be leached away. Um, so that's a great, great question. Alec, yeah. Going back to the modulation from the bitch. Yes. When did we last apply uh, a rhizobia inoculant? The question is on nodulation. When did we last apply rhizobia inoculant? That would have to be a question for Amy. So I didn't um, apply those here. Um, in hindsight, again, that, that would have probably been a good thing for us to do. We, we apply it frequently across the street here. Um, so, uh, you know, I feel pretty good that we've got it out there, but. Um, not applying it. <laughs> no, oh, okay. Well, it's early yet, but we'll <laughs> we'll see. So yeah, Alec uh, is saying that could be some some bigger, better nodules. I, I think it's a good practice to apply uh, inoculant, and just didn't do it in this trial. All right. So the clovers are are sort of disappointing. The frosty looks better than the fixation. The fixation is is pretty much a failure at this point. Um, you know, I don't see it recovering really from that. Um, but the frosty is looking okay. There may be a 
compost effect, at least in one, I didn't take pictures, you know, to try to demonstrate that. And this is the kind of thing we'll just have to pick up with the research. Um, but I, you know, there may be a frost, uh, an effect on um, the compost on the clovers, but not necessarily on the nitrogen. Okay, I wanna wrap up here and give Justin plenty of time. So the Western Cover Crop Council was formed in the summer of 2018. And you know, what are we talking about here? Well, SARE divides up the country, the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education um, Grant uh, Group. Um, they are, you know, they provide farmer grants and, and research grants. So hopefully you guys are familiar with SARE. This is kind of how they divide up the country. And everybody else has a cover crop council, so we want one. Um, you've got the Northeast Cover Crop Council, the, the Midwest Cover Crop Council. I think they were the first um, the Southern Cover Crop Council is the newest one, just um, not including the Western Cover Crop Council. So um, we've applied uh, for some support from SARE to really kick this off. We have a great group of collaborators from Idaho, Washington, Oregon, Utah, um, California, and the Plant Material Centers too, also being involved. Um, so. I'm optimistic that we'll, we'll get some funds um, in our ov overall goal of increasing cover crop adoption across the West. So one of these is a state enhancement grant, um, which would fund some survey groups, some focus groups and surveys, looking at adoption rates currently in the West, um, factors associated with adoption, barriers to adoption, rates of participation in federal incentive programs, opportunities to promote adoption and outreach and research gaps. There would be some sub-regional meetings because, um, you know, when you look at that Western U.S., it's huge, many different climates, um, difficult to sort of find one recipe that's going to work everywhere. So kind of focused on sub-regional activities, um, build a presence, work also with the seed industry. And then another grant that we have is a research to grassroots grant. This is um, just Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. And what we wanna do with this grant is um, getting cover crops and, and kind of trialing cover crops on farms. Um, one thing here, this um, simple and systematic cover crop evaluation criteria. So kind of what's that minimum data set that you could gather as a farmer and maybe share that um, through a database, you know, so that, that information would be meaningful. You know, what was your planting date, planting rate, um, some biomass. So we'll be able to do those um, create something that, that makes it very easy, hopefully for people to participate in. Um, NRCS developed a Pacific Northwest cover crop selection tool, and we would like to improve that and um, improve both the information and also the access to it and share project results. So that's kind of where we are on the um, Western Cover Crop Council. And again, more of like a stay tuned message there. Any questions for me before I pass it off to Justin? All right, I'll be here all day. Everybody hear me? Is it coming through? Yeah. Okay, good. We all set? Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk to you today about managing health, uh, soil health with, um, and crop diseases with brassica cover crops. And um, I, I'm also just curious how many people in the audience have you played around with brassica cover crops? So a few of you, any of you tried to use them for biofumigation? Oh, a couple of you. Okay, good, good. So a lot to learn today. Um, so these, this is a list actually from Cornell Soil Health Program. Um, and I just wanted to illustrate that um, brassica cover crops cover just about every, or can at least help mitigate just about every one of these aspects. Um, and the key one really is 
this, this one right here, small population of plant pathogens and insect pests. So it has this really, really unique ability to provide a service called biofumigation and reduce soil-borne pathogens in particular. Um, a lot of what um, I'm going to talk about today was informed by this project that I did in my previous position when I was still with Extension in New York, um, which was this project here. The final report for this grant is actually due today, so it's just ending. Um, where we were looking at brassica cover crops, and actually we were combining brassica cover crops and rolled rye um, in a, in a no-till context, or a reduced till context, to um, try and manage Phytophthora blight, which luckily we don't have a problem with out here. Very tenacious uh, soil-borne disease of cucurbits and nightshades. So um, just going into some basics, uh, what is biofumigation? Very simple definition, suppression of various soil-borne pests and pathogens by naturally occurring compounds. Um, and when we talk about biofumigation, especially in this context, we're mostly talking about brassicas. Um, in particular, usually mustards and arugula. So how does it work? Um, so the thing with brassicas is they naturally produce these compounds called glucosinolates. Now, this is a sulfur-containing compound that makes certain brassicas hot or spicy. So if you've had horseradish or arugula, you know that it, there's a certain bite to those. Those are from glucosinolates. And this is really the essential component in biofumigation. Um, so if you look at this chart here, um, glucosinolates are within plant cells, and so is this enzyme called neurosinase. And um, these two components, when you macerate the cell or um, chop the cell up, you can get them in contact with each other. And when they come in contact again with soil water, they produce this um, compound called aloe isothiocyanate. So you don't need to necessarily memorize that, but you need to know that this breakdown product, this ITC, is, is what is responsible for the fumigation effect. It's actually, it's literally a broad spectrum fumigant. Um, it's actually really similar to a conventional fumigant called Vapam, which is methyl isothiocyanate. Um, and I just wanted to point out too that in a typical brassica cover crop, you're going to have about 10 to 60 times less than you would, uh, 10 to 60 times less fumigant than you would from a typical Vapam application. So there's a lot less there. So when this, uh, this mechanism was discovered or becoming more popular, there's a lot of big hopes for it. Um, a lot of studies, a lot of lab studies, at least on uh, disease suppression of fusarium, versilium, rhizoctonia, pythium, sclerotinia, botrytis, phytophthora, and more. Um, same with nematodes. And they also have this ability to inhibit seed, uh, weed seed germination too, because it's, just, again, it's this broad spectrum fumigant. Um, and uh, in lab studies, they really show that this mechanism, it indeed does work. That breakdown product can indeed suppress fungal pathogens. Um, and, when you brought, and when some people started to actually bring this into the field, they saw that sometimes this, it does work. It does transfer into the field. You, a, you are able to get a disease suppressive effect from them. Yes, question? I didn't, did I see agrobacterium on that list or not for town ball? No, no. So these others are all soil borne fungi and water molds, but yeah. not all, but it's just that. Yes, right. yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I don't know about bacteria, I'm not sure. Oh yeah, um, uh, somebody in the audience had a question about a certain um, soil-borne bacteria pathogen. And I said that I wasn't sure if uh, that was one of the uh, pathogens that could be controlled with biofumigation. Um, and then there's other cases where people brought in this into the field and it didn't work or it had weird kind of confounded results or 
some other side effect that didn't work. Um, and in fact, the study that we did, I would add to this section on the bottom too now. So we didn't get necessarily a, a good uh, disease suppressive effect. Um, so the thing with this though, is it really wasn't intended to be any kind of silver bullet. It was intended to be part of an integrated management program. How many have seen the, the disease pyramid? Good, good, couple of you in there. Um, so the idea with this is that each of these components need to be in place in order for a disease epidemic to occur. So the pathogen, the plant, the environment, and time for the uh, epidemic to develop. And if you manage any one of these, you can reduce the chance of getting an epidemic. Um, so if you know how to manage each of those, it helps you strategize. And it's just really important to remember that products, so anything that you might add as a product to try and control disease, it's really, it's an intervention tool. It means all those components are in place and you're trying to stop it, you're trying to halt. Um, but an integrated approach is really the way to safeguard and try and get a more, um, try and control other, some of those other aspects as well. All right, so brassica cover crops. Um, so it's really important to remember too that with brassica cover crops, we're not just talking about the biofumigation effect, and especially because it's not necessarily always reliable, at least it hasn't been so far. So it's really important to, other, to understand the other aspects of brassicas as a cover crop period. So what do they, what do they bring to your, to your system? So these are all cool season cover crops, um, typically with a shoulder season timing, spring or fall planting, some are more winter hardy than others. Um, probably a lot of them will overwinter in Western Washington, um, but I've heard of instances where they, where they don't. Um, in the Northeast and in the Mid-Atlantic, which is where these two pictures are from, people actually use this to their advantage. Um, they tend to break down fairly quick, so you can use it as a sort of mulch. So it suppresses weeds in the fall, dies, breaks down on the surface, and acts as a sort of light mulch in the, in the beginning of the season. Um, some of the different species, daikon radish, or it's marketed as tillage radish, uh, oilseed radish, forage radish, turnip, mustards, arugula, rapeseed, or canola. So some of the characteristics of brassica cover crops, um, weed suppression. So if they're managed well, you can get a quick canopy closure. You can also get a quick vertical growth rate. Uh, this picture is actually from a trial I did in our high tunnel down in uh, Vancouver this past summer. And um, they can return pretty abundant carbon to soils too. So about 50 to 60 days of growth can return 2,000 to 3,000 pounds per acre of carbon, um, which is about 45 to 7,500 total pounds of biomass. Oh yeah, I meant to mention that. So um, I don't know this fellow, <laughs> but I think it's that, that name right there, uh, D. Guys is Dale Guys, and he's a grower in Eastern Washington that's uh, really popularized these, uh, these mustards. I think that might be his son. Go ahead. Uh, they're, oh yeah, sorry. Um, so uh, the first question was about uh, one of the pictures, which I'll get to. And the second one was about um, where these biomass numbers are coming from. So the lower end of that range are from Northeast. The higher end are from out here. So that picture right there, um, the one, is there a, uh, oh, I can do this. This picture right here. Um, so I'm gonna guess that this fellow is probably more than five feet tall. So I just, it just give, it illustrates really well how big these cover crops can get and how much carbon they can return. That's a Brassica juncea. Uh, it's um, 
oriental mustard. Um, also really, really excellent attractors for pollinators. You go into the field when it's at this stage and it's absolutely a buzz with pollinators. Um, a major thing with brassica cover crops is this um, diving taproot system. So um, it helps give them a really strong infiltration improvement potential and really high potential as a catch crop for soluble nutrients. They're one of the only, I think they are the only crop species um, or crop families that are non-mycorrhizal. So they don't form a symbiotic relationship with mycorrhizae to help them get nutrients. They need to get what's there and what's available and what's soluble. soluble. So it's sort of an evolutionary trait that they've, that they've uh, developed. Is that because of biofumigation? No, no, no. Oh, uh, he asked if it was because of the biofumigation. And I said, um, no, it's not. It's, 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 I think it's an evolutionary trait. Yeah. Um, so their ability as a catch crop is really remarkable, especially for like tillage radish. Um, pretty commonly find that they can catch over 200 pounds per acre of nitrogen. It really depends on the residual levels in the soil though. Uh, for mustards, we've measured between 130 to 180, probably on average. Um, and it's really important to point out that they'll catch more than you might apply to actually grow the cover crop. Um, this is because again, they're really responsive to soil nitrogen levels. Um, but a key aspect to it is because they need soluble nitrogen, soluble, um, soluble uh, sulfur, they really need starter fertility there to get going. Especially in spring after a wet summer and a lot of nitrogen has leached out of, this, of the top layers of the soil, you need a bit to get it going. This is a picture that someone sent me um, from Cornell where with an unfertilized brassica cover crop in the spring, and you can see that it's just tanking. They just can't get going because there's little to no nitrogen there. Um, they can catch other soluble nutrients like sulfur, which has actually been noted. Um, and the fact that they're non-mycorrhizal maybe gives them a disadvantage where either the, the soil mycorrhizal community is compromised or there's compaction. Um, this was a really cool study that came out of Denmark where they have a lot of problems with overwinter leaching, similar to what we do here. Um, and they were looking at a couple different brassicas, two brassicas, a couple different um, grasses, and then a couple um, legumes and a legume mix with Ryan Vetch. And again, they were looking at catch cropping. Um, from the biomass standpoint, they got pretty good results from the, uh, the brassicas. So comparable or higher than most. And this, this data really helps illustrate just um, how the, the aspect of those, that root system. So this is a root intensity rating. So how intensely was, were those roots exploring the soil? Um, it topped out the, it topped out the, the charts on that one. Um, this is how, how many accumulated degrees did it take to reach one meter or 3.3 feet? So you can see here that it took the least amount of time amongst these cover crops. And then and to the same effect, um, how, how deep did they actually go after 1800 accumulated degrees? Um, so you can see that they reached down to five foot compared to these other ones that reached around, you know, only around two or three feet. Um, and what this transfers to, or what this ends up leading to is this really strong ability to recover soil nitrate. So if you see that it's over 100%, it means that it actually recovered more than 
the section that they measured. So they measured a meter, and it probably means that it caught nitrogen that was below that because it got so deep so fast. So five, five feet down um, in a short period of time. Um, here's another study done by a colleague of Doug and ours out in Eastern Washington, um, where he got really good uh, results with increases in aggregate stability and infiltration rates. This is actually the aggregate stability. I jumped the gun on that one. So you can see significantly higher uh, aggregate stability in these rotations with mustard green manures versus conventional potato rotation without. So this was an on-farm study. All right, so I'm gonna get into growing for biofumigation now. So now that you have a baseline about what brassica cover crops in general can do for the system, I'm gonna talk about this unique service. So you're gonna to wanna to choose a species or a variety with a high glucosinolate content. A lot of work has gone into this. Um, probably the two most popular varieties right now that are fungal pathogen oriented are the Caliente varieties, which are Abrasca juncea, and the Pacific Gold variety, which is an older variety developed in Idaho. I believe it's Idaho. Um, this is also Abrasca juncea. The ones that are more nematode control oriented are uh, this Nemat arugula and Ida Gold, which is a different species of mustard. It's called a white mustard, Synopsis alba. Um, some other ones that people have looked at too are canola, rapeseed. Um, they typically do not have high glucosinolates. The advantage that they do have is that seed is cheap and it produces a lot of biomass. Um, but it really has to in order to build that glucosinolate content that you need to biofumigate. Um, there's also problems with canola and the seed has some dormancy, so it sticks around and can become a weed. Two that might be up and coming are pennycress, which is typically known as a weed, but they're starting to develop it into a uh, oilseed crop and it has glucosinolate content and then brassica carinata too. So just some pictures of different scales on which these, uh, this approach is used. So this is in Eastern Washington and potato country around Moses Lake. Uh, smaller scale in New York on a uh, diversified vegetable operation is about a 60 acre operation. And then um, on a market garden, so this is a, an arugula cover crop in a market garden in New York. So some major considerations. Um, I usually end up telling people to, to reframe your thinking about cover crops when you're talking about growing a Nebraska for specifically for biofumigation. It's an investment and you really need to think about treating it more like a cash crop. Um, crop rotation wise, you're gonna wanna rotate it before some, soil, some sort of soil borne disease sensitive cash crop. Um, you wanna think about rotational gaps away from and the literal physical distance away from your brassica cash crops too, because of potential for disease transfer and pest transfer. Um, if you, even if um, you're growing organically, but you might be in a transitional situation or you're on new land, um, it's helpful to know about the herbicide history because there can be persistent herbicides that will affect the viability of your cover crop. This picture was, yeah, your question? Okay. Uh, this picture, um, you can see here, this is actually where a plastic bed was. And they had sprayed in the alleyways. So that's why it looks a lot more lush in the middle and uh, depleted on the sides. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yes, it is. It's a really common concern. Um, so the question was regarding um, when people have brassica cash crops as a major component of their cropping system. 
and the concern about disease and, and pests. And yeah, it's a, it's a fairly common concern for anybody that is growing brassicas. So not the first time I've heard that concern. I'll actually touch on that at the end too. Um, the season timing need about 50 to 60 days. Um, typically, the, the windows for opportunity are in early spring. Um, up north, maybe April to June, down by where I am in Vancouver or farther south, you might be talking as early as um, March into May. Um, late summer is another good opportunity as long as you have the ability to irrigate and get it established. Um, so that window is from August to October or maybe even later. Um, and then winter is an option too, especially for the arugula, which is um, which will overwinter on, in Western Washington. But even some of the some of the springs will will survive a, a Western Washington winter. Seed bed prep um, conditioning. You really need to condition the seed bed for a small seeded crop. Um, so you want it fairly weed free when you go into it. Um, <clears throat> You want to make sure that your fertility is good. Uh, soil test for recommended phosphorus, potassium, micros, and you can, if you get a soil test for it, you can say that you're growing mustard to get recommendations. Um, like I mentioned before, starter nitrogen is really, really important, especially in the spring. In the fall, it might not be as important, um, but in the spring it is um, when, when nitrogen levels are low. And the same goes for sulfur, too. Um, I mentioned before that glucosinolates are a what type of compound? A sulfur compound, exactly. So if there's not sufficient sulfur there, they can't produce what they need to produce for biofumigation. Heating, um, always tend to recommend a drill. Broadcasting will work. Um, it's just that it's less efficient. Uh, more stand variability. Um, the depth is also fairly thin too, so it's hard to, hard to get a way to, uh, to rake that in very, fairly precisely. It's really small seeds, so it can't go very deep. Uh, mustards are typically 10 to 12 pounds per acre. Arugula, six to eight, it's a smaller seed. If you broadcast, you wanna bump up towards the higher end because you're gonna lose some, some of that stand. Um, same with uh, late seedings or a shortened season, you could probably bump up the rate to actually bring up the, the population. The downside is it's going to cost you more in seed. Um, you also want to assure that because it's small seeded that you've got adequate moisture. It, it just doesn't have a lot of resilience to, to work through a, a dry spill. Management, um, typically these crops are top dressed um, between 100 uh, or 50 and 100 pounds is is usually pretty adequate, especially again in the spring um, when nitrogen soil nitrogen levels aren't fairly high. Some growers go as high as 150. You can see in this picture on this side you have a plot that's fertilized with 150 pounds, and then over here. This was an unfertilized plot. This is a WSU study in Eastern Washington. This is another picture from New York. You can see this depressed area in the middle right here where there was a really strong fertility gradient between what was on the edges of that field. So if these, if these crops don't get adequate water or adequate nitrogen, they're just really highly likely to tank. And it's really important to remember um, your fertility depends on your crop history. If you've got a long history of growing other cover crops, legumes, compost additions, your inherent fertility is going to be higher, right? So you're going to want to lower these, um, these, rec these general recommended rates if that's your case. And again, even if you add something, you're going to get more back than you applied. We saw that pretty consistently in our studies. And um, the cycling too, when you turn this in, it, the C to N ratio is about 14 to one. So is that quick turnover or is it gonna stick around and not break down? Really quick. 
yeah, it's a quick breakdown. You should get a lot of it back and fairly quickly. Again, I mentioned this before. If it's droughty, you're going to want to irrigate it. Um, just to illustrate how important uh, fertility can be for uh, biofumigation, this was a study that my colleague um, Sandy did back in Long Island, actually. Um, you can see in this year, 2010, right here and right here, they had a significant effect on Phytophthora rot, uh, uh, or on Phytophthora suppression in their uh, two treatments that were fertilized with either 50 pounds per acre or 100 pounds per acre versus the control, which was unfertilized. So what to expect? Flowering usually begins after about 30 days. It's usually about two and a half to three foot tall. Um, and similar to what Doug mentioned about rye, is people get really nervous when they see flowers, especially with mustards, and they want to terminate it right away. I've heard that a whole bunch of times. And the thing is, is that, like Doug mentioned also, there's a long window. So it takes about six weeks from flower to hard seed. So you're going to want to let it flower away. Um, it doubles in height after flowering. It'll grow up to five feet or more if it's treated really well. Um, and you kind of want to think about this two to four, four week window after flowering in which to incorporate it. That's just a nice safe window of accumulating biomass, but making sure that you don't have any seed production. Um, another nice aspect about it is a lot of these varieties bred for biofumigation, they don't have dormancy, so they don't stick around. They're not going to stay in the soil and remain viable and come back as a weed beyond one year. Um, and uh, I wanted to note too that biofumigation potential drops after maturity. Um, and that's because those compounds actually get transferred to the seed. And the seed is harder to chop up than the biomass is. These are just a couple pictures of some uh, fairly healthy mustard. This is actually grown on a farm that had a really good uh, compost fertility regime. They did not add any fertilizer. Oh yeah, there's a question. Yep. Yeah. So the question was, um, when does the biofumiga bi biofumigation affect the cure? And I'm actually just going to get to that. Okay. Um, so this is some just really examples of really healthy mustard, big, deep green, robust leaves, thick stems. This is just when it's beginning to flower. That's a one foot square right there. Um, so you can see it's about just almost three feet tall. Um, and this, to your question, um, so we're going to go back to this because this reaction is what you need to facilitate in the field to make it work. Um, so you need to do this in sequence. You actually need to chop that biomass to get these two components of glucosinolates and myrosinase to come together. You've got to incorporate it into the soil to get it in contact with the pathogen and with soil water. Um, you're going to want to seal the surface somehow, usually with something like a cultipacker or some other type of roller. Um, you can also do it with irrigation too. So like using overhead irrigation, you can actually help seal that soil surface. The nice part about irrigating too is that if it's dry, you absolutely need it to get this water component in the reaction. Um, but it, it helps assure that you've got water and you're going to make this reaction occur in the field. Um, the thing that's important to remember is that these ITCs, they're, they're gases and their activity time is limited and you want to keep them in the soil for as long as you can in order to get that fumigation effect. Some of the equipment that you use, um, usually a flail is recommended. It, it gives a nice fine chop and a nice even chop. Um, a lot of people use rotary um, mowers and that can work too. It's just that the flail works a little bit better. Uh, of course, some sort of tillage implement. Rototillers work really nicely because they, they incorporate really, really evenly. Um, some sort of packing implement. 
Um, I mentioned this before, something like a cult packer. Um, and then irrigation lines if it's droughty. Um, <clears throat> so biofumigation has about a seven to 14 day biofumigation period. And I wanted to point this out here because, so you, you turn in your mustard cover crop, you, you flail it, you turn it in, you seal the surface and it's dry. Has the biofumigation period begun or not? Not if it's dry, because there's no water component. That water needs to be there. So if you go and you, you wait your seven to 14 days, you don't irrigate, it's still dry, and you plant your cash crop, and then you irrigate, what's gonna happen? That's right. It's gonna what? It can suppress your cash crop, exactly because it can inhibit weed seed germination. It can actually inhibit growth too of transplants. Uh, just some pictures of this in action. This was in the high tunnel down in Vancouver this summer. Uh, <clears throat> two different varieties that we looked at. Flailing, incorporating, packing, and irrigating. <clears throat> this is in Long Island on sort of a mid scale. Same sort of thing. Just a close up <clears throat> after flailing and after incorporation and packing. This is in Eastern Washington on a larger scale. They'll actually get equipment operators, three going at the same time to do it in tandem. And this is a video from, that's interesting. <laughs> well, hopefully you can still follow it. This is from uh, Brad Bailey in Eastern Washington. And he has a really slick setup where he's just got it all stacked together. So every, every one of those processes is all stacked together. Um, you want about a 10 day biofumigation period. So that's between that seven to 14 day window. Around 10 days is just sort of the recommended period. Um, it's going to probably inhibit weed seed germination by default, so you really don't have to worry about it during that period. Um, but at the same time, like I just mentioned, you don't want to plant crops in there during the biofumigation period. It can affect them. Yes, question? That is a good question. So the question was if, it, if brassica cover crops have an effect on club root. Um, I have a vague memory of somebody trying to do that or something similar. I can't remember if it was that or sclerotinia because it's also a host of sclerotinia. Um, but I don't recall it. You'll have to get back to me on that one. Yeah, you generally worry about both. You, you don't want to plant either during that time period. I've heard of problems with both. So the question was um, whether or not you should worry about transplants as well, and you do. Um, you probably want to do some sort of light tillage after the biofumigation period just to make sure that if there's any gases left in there that you release them before you plant your crop and consider the fact that maybe heavier soils might hold in gas more. There's more surface area, it, the soils can pack more tightly together, and at the same time, because there's more surface area, there's this question about whether or not they can even biofumigate as thoroughly. There's just more area to cover. Some of the take-home points, again, treat it like a crop or start to get in the mindset of treating it like a crop and as an investment in some sort of special service that you want out of a brassica cover crop. Um, use varieties that have specifically been selected for biofumigation. This is really important because they are bred for high glucosinolate content and high biomass, and that helps actually produce more fumigant gas. Yeah. Daikon radish is not one of those. Yeah. Yeah. That I uh, someone was asking about tillage radish, and um, it's not considered one of the.
crops has been selected for biofumigation. And I had it earlier because it really illustrates well that diving taproot system and catch crop potential that they have. Again, good seabed prep, good weed control before you get in there. Um, ample fertility, ample moisture. Again, they don't have ample fertility, especially nitrogen and sulfur and moisture, they're gonna tank. They're just not gonna amount to anything. So there's a question from online is, uh -huh. can brassicas be intersown between rows of non-brassica vegetables? Um, and if, if people online could tell me if they heard me ask that question, that'd be great. Um, so the question was regarding um, Interseeding? Oh, okay. So everybody can brassicas can be intersown between rows of non-brassica yes. vegetables? They can. They can be sown. In, uh, they can be sown in between, but it's going to be harder if you actually want to use it for biofumigation. Um, to be able to do that process is going to be really, really difficult. And then another one is: let us know where these varieties and seeds are available. Okay, I, I'll give you. A, there's something at the end that will help you with that question. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend sowing them in between rows of vegetables, but um, people, people have used them, in, especially in perennial plantings, but uh, I haven't seen it as much with, with, with vegetables. Um, seed timely for 50 to 60 days of growth. Follow the biofumigation steps. If you're actually not doing these steps, you're not facilitating that reaction in the field. This is a really important aspect. Consider issues with brassica diseases, residual herbicides. View biofumigation as one tool of many that you're using to combat soilborne disease. And of course, consider other benefits of the cover crop, especially nitrogen catch cropping, general fertility improvement, soil organic matter building, infiltration improvement, and just general soil and quality. Soil quality improvement. Um, getting back to that question that was earlier, uh, Pacific Northwest does have some restrictions beyond just whether or not you grow brassica cash crops. Um, there's, con there's, um, there's concern about disease contamination um, with black leg, black rot, club root, um, alternate hosting with some generalist pathogens like sclerotinia, which I mentioned earlier. And um, part of the key with this is using certified seed. So seeds that have had the fields inspected for these diseases. Um, also using sanitation practices. Um, and a major aspect of why these are concerned is there's some pockets of brassica seed production, both in the Willamette Valley and in the Puget Sound region. And there's concern about pollen contamination in addition to the disease, the, the disease transfer, the potential disease transfer. Um, if you talk to Extension, we usually can get a hold of these maps where they show where different areas are, of uh, seed production are, so you know if you're far, far enough away uh, to avoid that pollen contamination. Um, and the same with pests, too. Another concern I've heard about is flea beetle whether or not you can transfer between two crops. And the major thing I can recommend is separating from cash crop plantings. So literal physical distance from those cash crop plantings to keep that risk down. This, this website right here is one of the ones that you can find some seed sources on with CSANR mustard green manures. Um, and this is a publication by Andy McGuire. Again, this is east side oriented, but it has a lot of useful information in it. Um, and then this is from Cornell Cooperative Extension and has some of, the, some of the aspects of our project built into it. Are there any other questions before I step off? Yeah. Have you, so the question was about using mustard covered crops for wireworm control. Um, I haven't heard of it. Um, yeah, I, I would generally, 
probably think that I wouldn't take that route right away without examining it really closely to see if they're a host or um, whether or not they're actually effective. Yeah, yeah. There's other um, different kinds of seed meal products you can use too. Like I mentioned before, that those glucosinolates get channeled to the seed as it matures, and they actually use seed meals as a sort of biofumigation product too. And I don't know if that would be any component of some kind of integrated strategy with wireworms or not, but it might be a, might be a safer bet than the cover crop itself. Hold on a second. Given the mixed efficacy of the ITC, has anyone looked at the variables that might be at play there, such as soil pH, soil type, or soil temperature? Yes, they have actually each of those aspects. Um, so the so did the question go over with it does okay so um so yeah actually each of those aspects have been looked at at least to some degree and they all do play a role in some way or another and it indeed does play into why there's variability in the field and why you see pretty consistent results in the lab on the flip side yeah so I think this is a comment um, on line here from Bruce um, with regard to the last question that it's been tried in SJC, San Jose. San Juan County. San Juan County <laughs> with some success. Great. The, well, what, for, for wireworms? For the, are you talking about the wireworms, Bruce? Yes. Yes, okay. Any other questions? Looking to do more, more work with mustard cover crops in, down in Vancouver. So uh, if you're interested, just uh, let me know. Could you also just speak to the trade-off between reduced tillage and adequate incorporation? Yep, yes. So um, I, I view it, if you go, if you think about that first list of different soil quality aspects, um, <clears throat> one of the aspects of of those is is your your soilborne pathogen pressure. So if you've got an issue, if you've got a deep issue, you've got a soil health issue. So I just generally view it as sort of a a one-time investment or an incremental investment in trying to knock back that aspect of your uh, of your soil health issues, and then trying to counter that in other ways with bolstering soil health in other ways, like reduced tillage and other cover crops. Does that help? Any other questions? Thank you. All right, thank you, Justin. Uh, we got one, uh, one announcement. Let me give the mic to our NRCS representatives here. So we have some people from Puget Sound and Northwest Working Groups. And one of the handouts that you have is a little one pager about um, adaptive management for conservation practices. So this is a little bit new even to our, uh, the offices here, but it's something worth looking at. And then Tara was gonna tell about some um, other opportunities for cover crop cost share. Hi, good morning everyone. Um, yep, so I'm here for NRCS from the uh, Puget Sound team. So we cover five counties, um, Pierce County, Thurston, King, Kitsap and Mason County, and also the Northwest team, which covers a bunch of counties up in the northwestern part of the state, have um, a specific emphasis this year on uh, projects to help with soil health. And um, that includes using cover crops, either to break up your plant pest cycle, to improve your soil organic matter, uh, reduce tillage practices as well. Uh, so we do have cost share available for those sites of sorts of projects through our environmental quality incentives program, also known as EQIP. Uh, so I did bring a little one page flyer out there, um, which talks a little bit more about EQIP and how to uh, essentially apply for the program to get that sort of cost share. 
but um, essentially if you were to get a contract to do some of these practices, you'd be looking at per acre payments for uh, starting to use a cover crop to help with your soil health. So uh, I'm going to be around for the rest of the day uh, with some of my other NRCS counterparts as well. So if you are interested or have questions, um, definitely reach out and we can help you with that. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Sarah. All right. We are going to um, break for lunch. And again, because we're doing the webinar, we'll kind of follow a tight schedule here. So it's 1130. We're on time. And uh, we will start the farmer panel at 1215. So I think for all of those of you in the um, webinar world, we'll probably go to mute for a while, but we'll come back on shortly before 1215 and we'll start uh, promptly. That's our plan. Okay. Thanks. Nice. Okay, one other sort of housekeeping thing. Um, we have an, a paper evaluation here that we will pass out to everybody. So please take a minute to fill that out towards the end of the um, workshop. And then for the online audience, we will um, do an online evaluation. And it's not done yet, but it will email that to you probably tomorrow. So please also take a minute to give us some feedback. We really appreciate it. All right, we're super excited about our farm panel. Um, unfortunately, Holly Foster couldn't make it. She is um, sick today and uh, at Zestful Gardens Farm, but she um, unfortunately couldn't make it. But we have Kevin Haggerty at Oxbow Farm and Raleigh Johnson at Early Bird Farm and Larry Thompson at Thompson Farm. So um, they're each going to begin with sort of an overview of their operation and how they use cover crops. And then we're gonna have ample time uh, for questions. So, don't know, we didn't sort of draw straws to see who goes first. Um, maybe I'll just pass it to Kevin or try, try that mic there and um, then we can keep this one roaming. Okay, take it away. Can you guys all hear me? Cool, it works. Uh, Doug, how much time do you have to spend on this? Are you better now? Oh yeah, cool. <laughs> you can answer questions. So we were, um, for this first part, uh, yeah, you got plenty of time. I'd say you've got, you know, 15, 20 minutes easy. Cool. On your own part, so. All right, well, hi everyone. Um, my name is Kevin Haggerty. Uh, I'm the farm manager over at Oxbow Farm and Conservation Center, which is a bit north in Carnation, uh, Washington in the Snoqualmie Valley. Um, I'll give you a bit of an intro on what Oxbow is and what our farm looks like and then just share with you why we use certain cover crops and, and how we use them. Um, but Oxbow is a nonprofit. Uh, it's both a farm and also an education center. Um, so we do a lot of educational work with early learners, uh, have a native plant nursery, uh, and a conservation team that does restoration work on site as well as throughout uh, the Snoqualmie Valley. Um, as far as the farming we do, uh, we're certified organic and we grow uh, mixed vegetables on 30 acres of land. Um, we've been doing that for uh, about 20 years, longer than I've been at Oxbow. Um, but the scale at which we farm the, that um, land has changed over the course of Oxbow's history. Um, we started out farming about two acres, uh, peaked growing uh, 30 acres of vegetables, sort of maxed out our land and have been tailoring it back down over the past few years. And so now we're farming about 15 acres of vegetables on that 30 acres of land, which means we have a lot of land that we're not growing uh, food on, um, which is what we do a lot of cover crop work on. Um, regardless of the scale and um, that we have been farming, we've always found cover cropping to be a really integral part of our production mm -hmm. system. Um, and we've always tried to really hold mimicking natural systems uh, in our production systems close to heart as well. And I think cover cropping helps us do that. Um, so as far as what we do, um, and we've done sort of regardless of the scale, we uh, try to cover crop every winter, um, we're in a floodplain. Uh, and so 
to protect our soil, we need to um, cover it up, keep it from floating away, and keep any excess nutrients from uh, running off into the river that surrounds us on three sides. Um, so we've done that um, every season since we started. Um, we also do a whole lot of other cover cropping as well. Um, and our goal and the reason that we cover crop is sort of threefold. We feel it plays a really impactful role in our soil health. Um, we think it is key to suppressing weeds on the farm. Um, and I also feel it plays a big role in how we manage pests and pathogens uh, at Oxbow as well. Um, so I'll sort of share how we use cover crops to do each of those three things. I'm not sure what the um, experience level is in the room, so I'll just talk big picture and then share what we do. Um, as far as uh, soil health is concerned, um, I mean, we need to feed our soil um, and we feel like cover cropping is a really great way to do that. Growing vegetables is really extractive. Um, and so to ensure that the soil is capable of um, giving us the yields that we need uh, and continuing to grow vegetables in year after year after year, um, we needed a way to feed all the microbes um, that make our soil what we need it to be. Um, and so cover cropping is a way that we do that, growing something on our soil um, rather than leaving it bare um, is a really valuable thing. Um, you never see bare soil in nature. Um, and so we try to cover up our soil with some type of growing plant uh, whenever it is possible. So if we're not growing a cash crop, we try to grow a cover crop um, in our fields and allow those plants to um, take the energy that they're producing through a photosynthesis, store it in their roots and exude it out into the microbial life around them. Um, and through doing that, that better? Sure thing. Okay, cool. Um, and so through doing that, you know, we're improving our soil structure. Um, we're, you know, improving the porosity of our soil and its ability to uh, hold water. Um, and then we're also helping uh, make it more fertile uh, for the cash crops that we're going to grow. Um, later when we're not growing a cover crop on it. Um, so uh, that's, I mean, a big way that cover cropping uh, relates to soil health on the farm. We also try to grow a lot of legumes um, and grow our own nitrogen as much as we can uh, because we all know that nitrogen is expensive. Um, so we do that. Um, uh, we grow as far as like legumes that we grow, we grow a lot of vetch. Um, for a winter cover crop, we grow rye and vetch. Um, and we grow that, you know, on most of the land that is out of production in the winter. Um, we also grow a lot of Austrian winter peas and crimson clover on the farm as well. Um, uh, as far as weed control goes, um, with 15 acres out of production, in the summertime, uh, it means that if we're not growing stuff on that land, it's going to be growing weeds. Um, and so we try to take advantage of that rest period um, in those uh, unused fields uh, and put in some cover crops that are going to help smother out future weeds on the farm um, and take advantage of their canopy to do that. Um, so we grow a lot of buckwheat in the summer. Um, filling in short gaps between a spring crop and a fall crop or between like a bare fallow period. Um, and then we also like to grow sorghum Sudan grass on the farm as well and something we can leave in the field um, throughout the course of the season, mow a couple times um, and rely on that to do some weed control for us too. Um, as far as breaking up pest cycles and, and helping with pest control. Um, I think it's really important to grow a diversity of crops uh, and growing cover crops helps um, us do that. It adds a lot of 
plant families into our system that were not necessarily growing if we were only growing vegetables. Um, so uh, we, you know, grow grains, we grow clovers, we grow all types of stuff by growing cover crops on our farm. Um, one thing that we've really noticed is growing cover crops in fallow fields also um, provides habitat for beneficial insects as well. Um, and insects that will predate on the pests that we see uh, on our specific crops. Um, something that we've really liked to do is grow phacelia uh, inside our brassica fields and around our brassica fields, um, and then match that with releases of lace wings and uh, parasitic wasps that can use the phacelia as a nectary. Um, and so keep those populations near our sensitive plants. Um, so we do that and we found it really successful um, and we just plant that like we would a carrot with a jang cedar. Um, and then we can cultivate it with a G while we're out there cultivating any of our brassicas. Um, uh, other pests, um, other things that we plant to help with pests and pathogens. We like growing clover and we underseed most of our brassicas with crimson clover. Um, and we work that in, we seed it out and work it in on our last cultivation of the clover, of the um, brassica, and then let it sort of grow. And in the springtime when we're finished harvesting rapini from kale, um, we'll mow the kale really high and let the clover grow out and sort of provide habitat for pollinators, help decompose those brassica stalks really quickly. Um, and just adds a lot more diversity into our, our system. Um, I think that's most of what we do with cover cropping at Oxbow. Um, we've been working with Doug a lot on some cover crop research, which has been really exciting and fun. Uh, and we've learned a lot from it too. But uh, we plan to continue to cover crop. And, um, as far as challenges that we've seen around cover cropping, uh, I mean, it can be, it's costly got to buy a lot of seed um, and then if we you know if you don't get your seeding rate right um, you can be growing weeds in your cover crops too and so that's been a challenge that we've had to work on and try to make sure that we're not creating a problem um, by growing cover crops at the same time too um, but I think that's that's what I got Okay. Um, yeah, my name is Raleigh Johnson. Um, I run Early Bird Farm in the Puyallup Valley. Um, I think Allie, you're the one who's in trouble for putting that silly photo of me in the bio. I just saw it. I haven't even looked at it until I saw it. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, so I'm kind of the small market gardener, market farmer uh, on the panel here. And what I do on my farm is a little bit unique in terms of how we use cover crops. So definitely, I think going to be an interesting story to tell, but it's definitely not what most people do in terms of how they manage their fields uh, because I'm incorporating my laying hens so intensively into our rotation. Um, but I do want to uh, share because I think it's an interesting system that has been working uh, really well for us. Um, to give a little background on my farm, uh, I guess I can we can pull up photos to make it more interesting. <laughs> Should I press it harder? There, let me try it, Doug. Um, I'll just keep talking and Doug will find the photos. Um, so um, early bird farm, uh, my wife and I in 2013, we bought a 10 acre property in the Puyallup Valley right here, just a few, few minutes away towards I-5. Um, we are, um, so um, the, I just finished my fifth growing season. Um, and um, we grow, I have about three and a half acres uh, that I've plowed up. Um, that's not my farm. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, so we felt really lucky to find this property. We're in the Piala Valley, which has beautiful fine sandy loam soil. Um, and it's a 10 acre property. Um, it's very wet down at the bottom. Uh, so um, not all of it is 
uh, able to be cultivated. So we leave a few acres in pasture that we run our chickens on when it's dry in the summer. Um, but we have plowed up about three and a half acres. Um, and I'm limited by water as well. I don't have a water right. It's just a small property um, without a water right um, that had not really been historically farmed. It was just a hay field for 20 years before we bought it. Um, so um, I'm limited by water. I can only grow a couple acres of crops uh, a year. Um, so it kind of forces me to fallow some of my fields and grow more summer cover crops than maybe otherwise I would. I don't have the I'm not using all my fields every year uh, just because we don't have enough water to do it. Um, but we're in a unique spot where we're at the bottom of the valley, the, the, the very end of the Mount Rainier watershed. So we have a high groundwater table even in the, the dead of summer being right by the Puyallup River. So um, I'm able to grow my crops with very little irrigation, I'm just kind of using drip only. Um, and then uh, once the crops can, transplants can reach their uh, roots down, they can usually find the water. So we Typically, even though we have sandy soil, we don't have to irrigate very much. Um, but um, I'm not able to um, overhead irrigate uh, uh, an August cover crop in. Uh, I, need, I need rain to help me um, get cover crops established. Um, and as a small market gardener, I don't have really heavy equipment. I do use a tractor, so I have a, just like a finishing disc that I can work in a cover crop with uh, and, a, and a brush hog mower. Um, so I don't have really heavy equipment to, to work a cover crop in either. So I don't, uh, I don't do things like um, cereal rye um, because, you know, rye gets really tall, it's really woody, and it's, it's something that would take a really long time for me to work in with my little 30 horsepower tractor. Um, so I have to think a little bit more carefully about which cover crops to use um, so that I can actually, um, you know, get a field prepped in order to, to plant. So, um, so I'll talk a little bit about my cover cropping system here. Um, where should we start? Um, okay, I'll start with the chickens. Um, so um, I, in terms of how I run my farm, uh, we, we do about two acres under cultivation a year with um, two high tunnels as well for tomatoes and stuff like that. Um, I sell at a farmer's market in Seattle and I run a, um, we did a 60 share per week CSA this past year. Um, and uh, the eggs uh, I sell at the farmer's markets and through the CSA. In the winter, the off season for vegetables, I, I need a break from the market. So I sell my eggs wholesale to local grocery stores in the winter, but they go to the farmer's markets and the CSA in the summer. Um, and what else? I, I employ uh, three interns uh, during the growing season from uh, April through the end of October uh, for our 20 week CSA season. And then in the off season, it's just me on the farm. Um, we actually, I actually start my baby chicks around Halloween at the end of the growing season when my interns are just finishing the season. And I brood those baby chicks over the winter so they start laying in the spring when, um, when our market season starts. So we have lots of eggs. And we overwinter one of our older flocks of chickens. You can see in the picture, there's two mobile coops, one off in the distance there. Um, and each coop has about 250 hens um, when they're out on the pasture. And, um, so the way I rotate the chickens through my fields uh, is um, in the summer months when it's dry enough, the winter months they're, they're in around the barn because uh, it's too wet to have them out in the fields and I don't want all that um, manure and nitrogen leaching into the, the waterways. So uh, in the summer months when it dries out, April or May, um, I bring them back out to the pastures and um, the chickens will, are on about a quarter acre at a time the, with mobile uh, portable electric fencing and those coops um, you can see the, uh, they're on wheels as well. So the chickens will go in each night and roost in those coops. So if I wanna move them, it's really simple. I just close the doors once they're all in at night, um, bring the tractor out, hitch the trailer and drive it to a new spot. So it's an incredibly mobile system and the uh, portable electric fencing is 100 foot strands that comes down really easily and one person can carry them. So um, it takes about an hour uh, for two people to move uh, 500 chickens from one part of the farm to the other. It's really not a big deal. Um, this year, what my crew did was we would, um, we have some extra fences, so we're able to set up the fences uh, in the daytime. I have my crew kind of set up the fences. If we need to mow the grass, we do that during the day. And then all I have to do is come in in the evening with once my crew has gone home at the end of the day and, and hitch the chickens to the tractor and just drive them to the next spot uh, before I go to bed. So. Uh, it's a real simple system to move the chickens around. Um, and so it's a really careful rotation um, because we're growing vegetables and we need to be aware of the uh, organic uh, and health safety standards. So we follow the 
um, 90 and 120 day rules, um, much longer scale than that for having fresh manure on our vegetable fields. So what we'll do is um, each spring, this photo is um, a spring shot of a, uh, this was in like May last year, of a field that was in vegetables the previous year. Um, we grew like um, some green beans. Um, this is kind of our random crop field. There were like green beans and beets and lettuce and things that don't really need a careful crop rotation. We're in this particular patch, but um, so there's not very much uh, crop residue in this photo, but sometimes they'll be out in an old brassica field where they're eating down, eating down kale, rapini and stuff like that. Um, but in this photo, um, there's some remnants of a cover crop. They've kind of eaten through it already. But um, in the spring, they'll, what, basically what the chickens are doing is they're mowing down the previous year's vegetable crop. Um, and I move them through all the vegetable fields that we're, we're gonna fallow and cover crop that year. So um, once the chickens are out of here, um, I try to get a cover crop on uh, that field um, after the chickens have dropped their manure. Um, one more thing to note about this system is the trailers, the chicken coops are in the walk paths. So those, it's a little hard to tell in the photo, but they're on a, gra a permanent sod walk path. And I put their feed troughs, which you can see in the picture, um, out in the actual field and I, where the crops were grown and, I, and where the cover crop is. And I rotate the feed troughs around I mean, the chickens naturally, they forage all over the field and they spread their, I want them to spread their manure evenly. I don't want there to be hot spots of nitrogen in our crop fields uh, for the pre next year's production. So um, this is a way to make sure there aren't hot spots of nitrogen. Um, and any hot spot of nitrogen is gonna be in a grass walk path that never actually gets a crop. So it's not a big deal. Um, so the chickens are on a patch for about two weeks at a time um, for the amount of chickens I have and the amount of space they're on they kind of will eat this down to nothing and be ready to move on. And I don't, I don't want them to over uh, pasture a certain area. Um, so after they're gone, um, I want to get a cover crop in for the summer. Um, and typically buckwheat has been really awesome for us. Um, let's find some buckwheat. Oh, there we go. Um, so this is um, probably, you know, buckwheat's a quick 40 day to flower kind of cover crop. So, but I need to get it in before the end of the rain. So sometime in May, um, I'll broadcast buckwheat seed. And because we don't have any, a, a drill or any, a grain drill or anything like that, I just have had great success with just a hand crank um, broadcast seeder, uh, just walking through the fields. Uh, and then I follow it with, a, with our finishing disc on the tractor to just make sure that there's seed to soil contact. And then I wait for some rains that we always get some, at some point in May or June. There's usually some residual soil moisture in the soil in May. Even if we don't get a lot of rain, the buckwheat germinates without a, an issue because the soil is still moist. Um, and so I guess this is probably in June or early July when we're mowing it down. Um, and then that leaves us, uh, once the buckwheat has been incorporated, um, I like the buckwheat because it's so fast, it outcompetes any weed. Um, so we don't have any weeds going to seed with buckwheat that we have to compete with at all because it's faster than any weed setting seed and it smothers them out. Um, so then um, we'll have a kind of a fallow period in late July and August where there's really nothing growing in the fields because there's no rain. Um, and what I really like to, to do and I wanna do more experimenting with, but I'm limited in terms of whether we get rain or not is winter kill cover crops. And um, Kevin touched on it briefly at Oxbow and Doug didn't really talk about it much today. So I wanted to get feedback from folks in the audience when we do the Q&A about success with winter kill cover crops. But the benefit um, of a winter kill, and also um, it was talked, Justin talked about it with the mustards, is, um, is a winter kill cover crop is seeded usually in the late summer, um, and then it will frost, it will die with a hard freeze, and it will start rotting all winter long. Uh, and Lacey Facilia is a great example of a crop that can uh, winter kill in our climate. Um, I've heard that some really mild winters it might not winter kill, um, but the one year that we had success with it, where we had the right uh, you know, rains around August 1st, August 1st is kind of the recommended seeding date for Lacey Facilia to get it to do its thing. Um, if you seeded it around that date, um, which we did in this, this year, which this was a couple years ago when we actually got rain in the summer, we haven't had rain in the summer in a few years. Um, but when you do get the rains in the summer, you can do this. Um, so this was a uh, photo was probably taken in September. So we get like a late September uh, bloom of flowers for our pollinators, which is really nice because most of the um, pollinators are gone by that. Most of the flowers are done by that time of year. 
Um, so it's a really nice, this was like a half acre of Lacey Facelia. And it's pretty fast growing like the buckwheat. So it does compete well with weeds. And then it did winter kill. So it started to die over the winter. And by the time spring came around, it was pretty much rotted away. But it did have an, it did leave a nice ground cover of rotting material to protect the soil um, in the event of a flood, because we do have flood risk as well. Um, and so for me, being a farmer without big equipment, this is really nice because I have a field that's really easy to work in in the spring so that I can get a crop on it early. Um, if I had a living stand of, of rye or another grain out there um, that was still growing, it'd take me a really long time to get it worked in. And sometimes I can't even get out there with my tractor until May because it's so wet. So I really want to use these winter kill cover crops um, more. And I'd like to talk with folks in the Q&A more about it. But this was a year we had success with it. Um, I also did oats that year, um, seeded around August 1st as well. And the oats headed up, they didn't go to seed, but they, they, um, they fell over and died. Um, and they left a thicker mat of material on the ground, but it, it didn't work out to be that much harder to um, chop it up in the spring than the phacelia. The phacelia really gave a nice soil texture, I felt like. Um, the oats, you know, because there's more carbon and woody matter, took a little longer time to work in. So the soil structure wasn't quite as nice in the spring when we got it to work. Um, but on the years, like the last couple years where we haven't had a rain, um, I, would, I wasn't able to do a winter kill cover crop. Um, so instead of a winter kill cover crop, um, well, I'll get to this picture in a minute. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, uh, go back to the chicken there. Um, on the, let's see. So on the fields where I had the buckwheat, I guess we'll go back to the buckwheat. Um, after we worked in the buckwheat and we had a couple months to wait, we waited for the fall rains and I would put in a cover crop that um, would be easy to work in in the spring because I was going to grow vegetables there the next year. Um, so for me, um, that has been as so I'm starting to turn to annual ryegrass because um, a couple of really nice benefits of the annual ryegrass is it's low growing, you know, it only gets like six inches tall at most. And um, so it's easier to work in the spring because there's not a lot of plant matter. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to do a grain, something that when there's a lot of nutrients in the soil from those chickens and from that chicken manure. So something that can take up the nutrients from the chicken manure um, and the annual ryegrass, I think, does that. Um, any grain really will do that. Um, I don't really need a legume because I've already put down all that fertility with the chicken manure. Um, so I'm not looking to, to use a legume as my fall cover crop, but something like vetch um, does work for a farmer like me because again, it's low growing and it's easier to work in in the spring. But the timing with the vetch flowering and getting the legume benefit is not great for an early crop because it doesn't flower until mid-May. And I might have already wanted to work my field up earlier than that. So um, where I would use vetch would maybe be in a field where I would have like a fall brassica because I'm not going to transplant anything in there until like July. Um, so anyway, um, the annual ryegrass has been really great for us. The other thing I like about it is it's really fast uh, to um, germinate and create ground cover. So even if we end up getting it in late, if the rains come late uh, like they do some years, um, the annual ryegrass is a good bet. Um, for getting the ground cover. So, um, and then we will grow a crop the following year. So really the, the crop is grown a year after the chickens are there, but because we're using cover crops like the buckwheat and then the annual ryegrass, they're holding on to those, the nitrogen and other nutrients that otherwise might've been leached away by the rains if we left the soil bare. Um, and then there's a more slow release of the, the, the animal manures for the following season's crop. Um, the challenge that we have, and that I'm sure a lot of you guys have, is how do we get a cover crop established on our fall um, production fields? Um, my farm is really heavy. Our, our, pay, our big paydays are fall crops. This is a, we do, we go really big on fall brassicas. Um, you know, I, this is my money shot of our fall. Cauliflower is a huge one for us at the farmer's market. We do it really well and, um, and we make a lot of money on it. So. But in a thick stand of, of a brassica like that, that I'm harvesting all the way into October and November, how am I supposed to get a cover crop on that field? Um, so what we had some success with this year was, um, was this interseeding the annual ryegrass and, and white Dutch clover. Um, so what we did was we, it's my fifth year of growing, so I've kind of finally gotten on top of my weed control a little bit better. Um, 
and uh, we had really good weed control on this field. And um, and our final hoeing, our pass, our final pass with the hoe, um, where we were cultivating these broccoli plants um, and the brassica plants, we just broadcast um, the annual ryegrass and clover in the field and then we hoed it in with our hose doing our final pass of the hoe. And then we basically waited for the rains, uh, which didn't come until sometime in September. And then this um, annual ryegrass and clover started to germinate. And you know, to be, this is my son Everett and my dog Perla. And you can see in the kale patch, it did really well. This was sometime in November. Um, it's really well established. The ryegrass much better than the clover. The clover is pretty spotty. Um, but in this, um, cauliflower area the coverage of the ryegrass isn't quite as good because by the time the ryegrass got going it was pretty shaded by some really big cauliflower and broccoli plants it's still there but it's not as dense as it is as it is in the kale patch so i think for something like the cauliflower ideally we would irrigate to try to get that ryegrass and clover growing before there was a full canopy of a broccoli or a cauliflower plant um, so maybe using irrigation to time the germination of the cover crop a little earlier would be better. But to do this is tough, like it requires really good weed control to make it happen. Um, and we were able to do it this year for the first time after trying for a few years and failing. Um, with my other fall crops like um, the, you know, uh, this winter squash, um, we're usually able to get the winter squash out of the field sometime in uh, October and have enough time to get a cover crop in after it by disking the field in and prepping it. Um, but again, the annual ryegrass is good because it germinates really quickly. Um, even late in the season. Um, so those are the basics of, of how I do the cover crop. Um, the cover crops, and I certainly would like to um, hear from folks because we're really just experimenting on this and I'm certainly not an expert um, and I'm learning, learning every year and I find cover crops to be one of the most complicated things to try to figure out and the rotations to make it work on our farm and really want to do something that we can manage and that's simple enough that um, it's not overwhelming for us and we're able to do it with the minimal tools that we have. Um, so we're still experimenting and, and learning every year. But I will say that um, the, the neat thing about this combination of the rotation, rotating the chickens and using the cover crops following the chickens is that um, I haven't applied any fertilizers of any kind to our vegetable fields um, at all in like the last three or four years, um, which is, and we, we we take soil tests occasionally. I don't follow soil tests really strictly. Um, I kind of just look at how the crops are growing and yielding and, and everything looks really good. I don't have any warning signs of having, you know, any particular nutrient deficiency. The one that I was kind of worried about was just general soil pH and do we need to even spread lime? And I haven't done lime in a number of years either. My theory is that because we add calcium to the chicken feed in order for them to produce their eggshells, um, they're pooping out at their excess calcium in their diet. And I've read conflicting things online about chicken manure and whether it raises or lowers or, or keeps neutral soil pH. But my theory is that chicken manure should actually raise soil pH. Um, so with that in mind, um, and that theory seems to be holding that maybe we won't even have to lime uh, our fields under this regimen. So it's worked so far. Um, it definitely will only work in an area where you can fallow fields for a year. Um, but it's, it's definitely something that um, we've had a lot of success with and I'm gonna continue to play with how the cover crops kind of fit into that, into that mix uh, each year. So I'll leave it at that and then we'll go to keep talking when we do questions. All right, thanks Raleigh. Yeah, let's move on to Larry. So yeah, keep your questions for now and we'll um, let Larry give his uh, description of his farm practices. All right, Larry, tell us a little bit about yourself too, thanks. How many questions are we going to have? Okay, um, yeah, my name is Larry Thompson. As you can tell, I'm the older one in the crowd here. In fact, I was talking to a couple of colleagues that I've met years ago on my farm that came out to my place. I've farmed my whole life uh, in the area of Damascus, Oregon. It's about halfway between Portland and Mount Hood. So it's, it's kind of the foothills of, of the Cascades. And I don't go to Portland a whole lot. I try to keep away from that town. But anyway, so I farm about 110 acres is what I farm now. Uh, my parents started the farm back in 47. My mom loves to tell this story. They immigrated out from South Dakota and came out to Oregon to raise strawberries and children. Well, they accomplished both, let me tell you. 
and so they start with five on five acres of property is all back then you could you could make a living on five acres of strawberries back in the late 40s and of course you can't do that anymore and so i went to oregon state university got my degree in horticulture with a with a uh, major in chemistry you know because i really enjoy that aspect of living and uh came back to the farm and my dad i he suddenly passed away on an announced walked in from the raspberry field collapsed and passed away and suddenly i was fairly young to be taken over a farm but it was the sign that i had to follow so i followed it and it, i got lucky it, everything worked out great for me uh so now i've increased the farm up i farm 110 acres of produce and berries now and i direct market all of it uh i'll tell you a bit of history my parents uh my dad was a great farmer and he had three brothers that farmed in the area also. And uh, they all farmed strawberries, raspberries, and broccoli. Everything went to the processor. In that, in that day, that's what you did. And the processors kind of ruled everything. The processors had field men that would tell you what to do and when to do it, when to apply pesticides, whether you had any need for it or not, you did it or else the, the canneries would not take your crop. Thank God that's all changed nowadays. And so when I took over, I didn't really like the cannery and processors and banks telling me what to do and how to do it and when to do it. So I decided I was gonna go direct market. And so I went through the process of going to Safeway Fred Meyer with my fresh produce and berries too. And then when new seasons came in, I went to them as one of the first farmers with them. I did some restaurant uh, sales too. And then I decided I'm gonna jump out there and just do it all on my own. I wanted to control my product from planting all the way to your mouths. I wanted you to be, be able to talk to me and say, he's the farmer that I get my produce from. And so I decided to go truly direct marketing. And so that's what we do now. Nothing goes off the farm except into people's mouths that either come to my farm stands or come to my stands at other locations. We have two main farm stands that run pretty much year round. Uh, depending on what the weather will let me do. And then I, I worked out a deal with a hospital, Kaiser Hospitals and Legacy Hospitals. So I have stands at various hospitals in the Portland area. So if you go to a farmer's market and you take that 10 by 20 canopy, you pick it up and you move it over and put it on a hospital complex, a campus. And that's me, that's what I do now. I've done the farmer's markets. Farmer's markets are terrific, they really are. I just wanted to have a little bit more control and do what I wanted to do. And so that's what we do nowadays. And so we were up to, we were in 15 places at one time. I've backed off to about nine places now. And we sell all 110 acres of produce for our own stands from start to finish. And I just really enjoy that a lot more because then I get to meet with the people. And yes, I do work the farm stand now and then all day long myself because I like to talk to the people too. But I do hire, of course, people to handle that. So that's kind of where we're at today. And uh, as far as cover cropping systems, I'm, I've, I just found out I was nominated as, get, get this, I'm up for nomination. There's three nominations that have made it so far now, and I'm one of them. And I'm, I'm being considered the pioneer in sustainable agriculture. I remember the day when I was the cutting edge guy on cover crop systems. I was using cover crops before it was a cool thing to do. Now I'm the pioneer, and all that tells you is I'm damn old, is what it tells you. <laughs> And so I've got a lot of history of, of far as cover crops go. I grew up on cover crops. My dad and my uncles all used cereal ryegrass because they, when they, they used it with the broccoli they would do. Main reason we did that was for erosion control. Nothing else was looked at except erosion control because our soil is only 12 to 16 inches deep. So you need to protect it. And all of you out there know that it takes about a hundred years of intense cover cropping to build one inch of soil. So you got to protect all the soil you can at all times. And so that's what we did. We'd spread, harvest the broccoli, spread the cereal rye out there, disc it in, and then next spring, hopefully it wouldn't be too wet because I have pictures of me on file in my old albums that show me out in the field with the rye grass booted up to six feet tall. And when you're running a basically 50, 60 horsepower tractor and an eight foot disc, it takes you forever to get that carbon down into the soil. And then hopefully it'll break down before you start planting again. And so that's what I grew up on. Now I've tweaked the system a little bit and tried some different cover crops. And so I'll give you kind of an overview of what, what I do now on the farm. And uh, as, far as, as far as the crops, I raise about 40 to 50 different crops on that 110 acres. Some berries, strawberries, raspberries, uh, boysens, marions, blues, and lots and lots of vegetables, lots of brassicas I raise. I really enjoy the cauliflower. And uh, 
and a lot of sugar snap peas and all kinds of various things. In fact, just yesterday I was, I was in the fields, we harvested four kinds of lettuces, two kinds of spinach, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kale, uh, carrot still, beet still, and uh, let me see. Yeah, that's about it. Oh, broccolini. I started broccolini this year, and that's been a pretty good seller on my farm stands. And so that was just harvested yesterday because, of course, it's been a very mild year. And let me warn all of you because all of you are much, much younger than I am, and that's this. When we have a winter like we're having, get prepared for the equalizer in the spring and summer because usually it comes. And so you need to learn to adjust whatever your cover crop strategy is, whatever your growing strategy is. When you get this wonderful weather at certain times of the year, much nicer than you ever expected, be prepared for the other half that's gonna come because it will come later on. So just keep that in the back of your mind. As far as the overview of my system goes, there's basically six different types of cover crops that I use depending on uh, am I on the top of my farm, on the side of the hill, in my delta area by my pond. That's a factor in determining what cover crop I use. Uh, what crop has been in there prior to that, for instance, on berry crops like marion berries can last 15 years in some soil and then when you take it out, I, I generally will go to a, a really large humus, big biomass type cover crop to replenish that soil because it's been kind of abused by monoculture for quite a while. The vegetables, it's not, it's not really dependent on, on uh, abuse because I haven't abused, but on the vegetable areas of my farm, I will look at what's my next crop gonna be. For instance, uh, let's see this. Let's say that I'm gonna go ahead and grow a few acres of corn in some certain areas. Well, the year prior to that, I'll probably put quite a bit of Austrian pea in to get my nitrogen level up extremely high because corn takes a lot of nitrogen more than other crops do. And so those are some of the factors that you need to consider about your farming. Is it, what is the uh, succeeding crop gonna be? So on the cereal rye is one of the, crop, one of the cover crops that I use. And what I like about cereal rye is it grows pretty much year round in the, in the Oregon area. And I, I would imagine up and through here too. And so if, if you can't get into the field real early because of your harvesting or something like that, even if it's into mid October, you can still seed cereal grass and get a pretty good stand and pretty good biomass by the springtime. And so that's kind of my, always my, my fallback one because of the incredible biomass. And then also the cover on the cereal rye, is, it's pretty good at re reducing some phylum population. It's been pretty handy at that. So, and that's been kind of a problem in our area. So in fields of, that I have, that I have cereal rye in, I can go a couple of years with using that. My some phylum population will go down quite a bit and, and that will help me tremendously. And then also it's a great one for overseeding. In other words, if you're like all of my, I, I do like these other gentlemen have done, I don't want any bare soil on my farm at all. That's not what soil is for. I always want something growing on either a crop or a cover crop or both of them at once. Like right now, the, the Brock and cauliflower fields that we're harvesting, I have a really good stand of cereal rye in there. The reason I do that, because you can go in there in September is the ideal month for seeding in my area for fall cover crops. I can go in there with a herd spreader and just spread out and cover about 20 rows at a time and, and either irrigate it heavily right then and there or I'll come through with my cultivator and just go an inch or two deep and just kind of disturb the soil all around and that'll be enough to get that ryegrass germinated and going. And so that's kind of one I use a lot in my vegetables and such. And then also what I will do is I'll go through and make pack rows and that's very important those of you that are raising vegetables in this wet area and that is I know I, I, I like to harvest six rows at a time so I'll overseed everything, hit the cultivator just an inch or so deep and I'll run a tractor with no equipment on it at all, just my tractor tires and make my pack rows for the winter time because it's going to push down that, that uh, rye seed uh, from the weight of the tractor wheels and it'll germinate very fast and then it'll really reduce my erosion for my winter harvest because I can run a tractor through there anytime I want and not really have a problem in my area. Now the other one I like to use, depending on the crop, if I, on my tomatoes and such and peppers and such, I do use annual ryegrass. It is like, like you said, it's a, really, it's a really good grass to have. It grows about six inches tall, covers it real covers everything real nice and then it doesn't take much horsepower in the springtime to turn that under for your humus and your biomass. There's not a lot of biomass still, it's really great to have in there. What the big thing in my opinion regarding the peppers and the tomatoes about the annual ryegrass is that it creates just kind of a beautiful carpet as you saw on the slides here. 
And I don't stake my tomatoes. I can't afford to. I plant 30,000 plants at a time, and I don't have 30,000 stakes to go out there and put in the field. And so when they, when they, whether you use determined or indeterminate uh, tomatoes, it doesn't really matter. They fall over. They fall onto a nice carpet of grass, and we have no mud on our tomatoes. And it really works well. And same thing for peppers too. It will really, you know, we're trying to pick some of the peppers in the fall time because around here, it's usually it's late summer, early fall when you do the peppers. It takes that many heat units to get it going. Well, if you got a nice annual ryegrass just around there and you can just spread that and annual ryegrass takes very little to germinate, very little moisture to germinate. And so it's a really good one to put there in the fall. It will germinate and grow. The key on the tomatoes, I should say, is you want to put your annual ryegrass down on the ground when your plants are blooming. When they start blooming, that's your signal to go ahead and, and uh, see the annual ryegrass in there because by the time it gets a perfect carpet, that's when you're gonna be picking tomatoes. So that is really key for tomatoes on that. And same thing for peppers too at bloom time is when you wanna apply that. And you'll really enjoy the success that you'll have with that. Uh, the other cover crop I like to use is Austrian pea, obviously, like I said earlier. It's really great at fixing nitrogen. And so if you're going to be going into, you know, corn or even some lettuces or something like that, you want a little bit higher nitrogen than normal. I like to use Austrian uh, pea in the winter before I plant those transplants. And I, I transplant most of my vegetables, what I do. You do that, you get away from having to fumigate or anything like that because it gets going quick enough and you can, it can withstand some of the fungi out there. And so Austrian pea, like I said, is a, is a really good one for uh, prior when you want high, high nitrogen. I've tried buckwheat. I myself have not had luck with buckwheat. I'll tell you that. It, it just doesn't fit the system that I'm under. And I'm sure it's me that has to change when I plant and how I take care of it. But it, it just has never really done really well for me. I've tried it a couple of times now, but I admit I've tried it in areas of my farm that are fairly wet and that could be the problem. It kind of drowns out come the fall. So uh, but I have tried it, and because what, what I'm looking for is what I heard uh, Raleigh say too is I'm looking for a good winter kill cover crop. That's what I want. And I thought buckwheat seeding in the late summer, early fall might be the one for me, but it just didn't give me what I needed out of it. And so that's a research proposal I'd sure love to see out there somewhere is some really good winter kill cover crops that we can use and incorporate into our systems because that would make our springtime planning schedules a, a lot more on time if that if that would winter kill, so we just have just stuff on top it to deal with. Uh, one that's, I think that is really overlooked that could stand some research is we have a lot of common chickweed in the valley areas of Oregon and Washington. I heard a little laugh over here because I think Raleigh's saying the same thing. I have found common chickweed, which is native here, to be an excellent cover crop for its purpose. I have no idea about the nutrient value of it, what it does to feed succeeding crops, but let me tell you, for erosion control and early blooming for some nectar sources for your beneficial insects, common chickweed is really a good one because it will be blooming late February, early March when there's nothing out there anyhow, and you will see the bees coming for that and try and find it on the warmer days that get up to 55, 60 degrees. And the other nice thing about the common chickweed is as soon as it starts to warm up like near 70 degrees, it dies. It's gone. It just dies on its own. That's a good winter kill. And so I like to see some research in that. I, and, and it's a fall germ, germinating uh, cover crop. And so like in some of my broccoli fields, I, I recognize what it looks like when it germinates. As, and some people go, my gosh, it feels getting weedy. I stop any cultivation out there and let that plant go. And it will create a beautiful mass under the canopies of whatever crop you have out there. And like I said, it doesn't get in the way and it, it dies when it starts warming up. So that's a, I'd love to see some research in the common chickweed. And then, uh, then of course, the, the sixth thing that I do is just a combination. I do a lot of combination of cereal rye and Austrian pea, some vetch and things like that, all depending on what I feel like at the time. Because I got my land paid for. I worked hard to pay for my land, so I get to play a little more than a lot of your other people have to do because I don't have land payments. And so it makes it kind of fun to try what we call them cocktail mixes and uh, mix them up together and just see what it does. But I've found for me that the cereal rye with Austrian pea is, works pretty well as an erosion control, as feeding the soil a lot better, giving me some biomass. And uh, like, like you saw, the trick is don't let your, car, your cereal rye get too large on you or else horsepower will take off on trying to control it. You, I got a question already, yeah. Uh, 
the, the question is what kind of seeding rates I assume is what you're asking for. Uh, we, I used to put 100 pounds to the acre of, don't write it down yet, I used to put 100 pounds the acre of cereal rye out there when I was a kid. It was $7 an acre is all it was for that seed. Well, it's much costlier than that. So I pulled down the uh, cereal rye to about, about 70 pounds per acre is what I put on for seed. And I'll go about 10 pounds of Austrian pea mixed with that is what I'll do. If that answers your question. Okay. Uh, the next heading that, that, uh, uh, that Allie would want me to talk about would be my motivation factors for cover crops. Uh, there's a lot of them. I mean, I think we've heard them all today already here, given as to why we want to put cover crops out there. It's just the right thing to do, builds your soil and, and cuts down your weed population. And also the big thing that we need to remember too is on fields where there's been a lot of cover crop rotations, your horsepower use per acre is dramatically reduced. And so using less fuel consumption, easier wear and tear on your equipment. I do run pretty big tractors because I got a lot of acres to turn that I got to turn quick but it's pretty noticeable with some of my bigger tractors. If I go into a field that I've used a lot of intense cover crops over the years, my horsepower is dramatically reduced the need for it. And you'll notice that quite, quite a, uh, right away. And some of the other uh, motivation factors, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, in my area, the nursery industry really took over the state for, or took over the Lima Valley for quite a while. Now, of course, it's, they've had their own set of problems now. And so I was able to purchase some, uh, some property from a, an adjoining nursery. And I got to honestly say that felt pretty good being able to buy some property from a nursery because they were the ones making all the money at the time. So I bought the property and it was pretty amazing because I had my cauliflower field by my pond area. So it was Delta type soil, really nice soil and always dark and, and you know, good soil when you work it up, you can smell it. You can smell that actual soil sweetness, I call it. And then I, when I took over the, the adjacent property, it was just a dirt road of 20 feet or 25 feet away from the nursery, took it over, worked that soil up. Oh, the horsepower I had to pull to try and work that soil up. It was dry looking, no smell at all, nothing. No worms, no birds were following me to get the worms. Then I'd go back over to, to my soil and the, 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 the native birds would follow me everywhere I went, picking up the worms and the, and the whole difference. And so it took me three years of using a lot of cereal rye, because that's what I was using at the time, but it took me three years before I could plant that, that field into anything that would make me any money. Not because the nursery was, was a bad farmer, it's just it was a different setup for agriculture, and they weren't into cover crops, and they were into a lot of chemicals. And so that's a huge motivation for me. When I saw the difference happen, over th it took me three years to get that, that field into production, that's a huge motivator about how important cover crops really are and how you take care of your soil. Like you said, you, you feed the soil, you don't feed the plants, you feed the soil and the rest will take care of itself. And so that's a huge motivation factor for me. And uh, my, my ultimate goal on, on farming someday when I do leave this planet is that I want my soil to be healthier than when I took it over. And I think I've, I've reached that. I, I too, I have not limed my soil in many, many years. My pH is right around 6.5. It just kind of hangs in there. And I think it's because you, you're growing a lot of different things, a lot of diversity, a lot of different crop, crop uh, cover crop strategies and cropping strategies. And I just think the soil will take care of itself and mend itself if you just treat it right. And so that, those are my motivation factors. Now, there was something I saw on, on the list of things we wanted to cover, and that is, <clears throat> What didn't work? That could take the next half hour very easily because I have a lot of didn't work situations. Uh, what doesn't work is regarding this kind of weather we're having, I've already been turning some of my cereal rye fields under. That's some of what I, I was doing this past week because it was dry enough to get out there. And I've farmed a long time and I know what's coming. A wet spring is coming, it just is. And so, rather than see my cereal rye get away from me in the fields that I'm gonna be planting earlier, which we'll start planting in March, some of the, some of the uh, transplants of lettuces, and we're gonna be transplanting kale, lettuces, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, broccolini, and beets. We'll start transplanting those in March. Well, I, I, I've already worked those fields under and got the, the cereal rye down, Austrian pea down and out of there because I wanted to dry quicker because my window of opportunity is probably gonna be pretty narrow because I'm expecting a fairly wet spring. Then I think we'll fall back into a dry 
summer and I'm not a meteorologist. That's my gut feel over experience. So, so uh, cereal rye is a great cover crop, but I've been caught a lot of times in the wet year. If it goes wet on you, you're gonna have five and six foot cereal rye to deal with. And then like you were saying, you have a serious problem. And I've been there many times. I've actually been in my situations, I've had to add nitrogen to the soil to get the carbon to break down because I was that much biomass was in there. And so you got to look at, at your farm as a holistic approach. And that is pay attention to your farm, the soil and the climate. And if you think it's going to be a problem later on, you better just do something about it when you can, no matter if, whether the cover crops got to its maturity or not. I think you need to look at it more holistically. And uh, some of the other problems that I've run into is that, is that, that with Austrian pea, it's uh, simply, a, one year I put it way too close to my, to my farm pond. My farm pond is a real attractant to geese. Well, they would land in my farm pond, then they would look over to my Austrian pea field and go, dinner time. And oh yeah, they wipe, they wipe that whole four acre field out of Austrian pea. And so that is, that is a situation, if you're in the fly pattern of a lot of geese and ducks, Austrian pea might not be the one you wanna go with because unless you like hunting, I don't know, but you're gonna have a problem of, of pretty poor uh, cover crop response in that. So what I've done to mitigate that a little bit is I, if I need to get closer to that pond area, if I feel I need to put some Austrian pea in, I will definitely add the cereal rye to it because it'll help cover and mask the Austrian pea and the, and the geese. If you can get it high enough, the, uh, the cereal rye high enough before the geese fly in the fly patterns, then they'll pretty much stay out of it. And so that's how I mitigated that. Uh, let me see. Uh, oh yeah, and the buckwheat, already covered the buckwheat. Now some of the barriers that I've, that I've, I've come into with the cover crops is it's, it's not always easy to have a cover crop in a very diversified farm because for instance, uh, the, the best time, like I said, in my area to seed an overwintering cover crop in particular is September. September is kind of the gold month because you still have the soil warmth yet. You got moisture coming in and the cover crop can take off and, and spread really well and cover the ground quickly. You know, but the problem for me is we're so diversified, our fall harvest is pretty intense. And so just simply finding the time to get the cover crop seeded out there, get it worked in. I do a lot of overseeding of my harvesting vegetables at the time. For instance, like I said, we'll go ahead and overseed. I already covered that. But then on some of the crops that I'm done with, uh, I, don't I don't really use a drill. I've got a, a, a drill that I don't really use. I just spread it out and then just disc it in lightly and pull a float behind it all in one, one pass, basically. And that's the way I get all pretty much most of my cover crop seed in there and get it germinated. It's not gonna be the most efficient as far as germination goes. A drill would be much better, but I just don't have the time. So that's a real barrier for me. I wish I could drill. I could probably cut the seed, the seed poundage down per acre, but I just don't have the time because we're harvesting other things uh, currently at the time. And so, and the other one would be seed availability. Sometimes farmers don't always plan, and I'm one of them. We don't plan that well in advance because we don't know what the weather's going to do. And quite often, when you start trying to seed, you know, like a 40, 50 acre field, it's pretty tough to have the seed right there. I'm not one to go out and store a lot of seed. I'm one of these guys that has a sharp pencil and I keep turning the cash over. And so, seed availability in my, in my area can be a problem because the nurseries tend to buy a lot of the seed up now, which is great. They're using it in the nurseries now. But so, seed availability and getting it in a timely manner is one problem that I've, I've got to try and figure out how to overcome. And of course, seed costs nowadays. Like I said before, it used to be $7 an acre. Now it's quite a bit more than that. So, that is a, that is a factor too. And, uh, some of the research we've kind of gone over to where I'd like to see, you know, some research in, in the common chickweed and stuff like that. Oh, and maybe, maybe someone out there can answer a big question that I have. Since I direct market, I, I do a lot of, get a lot of questions from customers and I usually have an answer for them, but there's some that really stump me. And the gluten-free scene out there right now, uh, everyone in my area knows I use a lot of cover crops and I raise things organically and such. And, but I had this question the other day and I couldn't answer it. And they said, well, I'm on a gluten-free diet and you use a lot of cereal rye in your field. So is the gluten being taken up by your crops? I said, I wouldn't think so, but thank you. I would say, I said, I wouldn't think so, but I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> okay, no, I mean, I don't see how it could. I know, yeah. well, deal with the public sometimes. <laughs>
<laughs> I could write a book on absurd questions I've had. And so, but anyway, I, and then the other question I have, and this one is for me. Now, please don't think I'm this really strange person, that, but I do spend a lot of time in a tractor seat, and that's when your mind wanders a lot. And this guy's laughing over here. <laughs> Okay, I swear to God, I swear to God that if I seed on a full moon, that stand is better. I swear to God it is. Is there any science regarding that? Is there? There's your research. Okay. Yeah, we'll look into it. We have, we have at least one biodynamic farmer in the audience. Maybe <laughs> speak to that. Where? Did he leave? David? Jubilee? <laughs> He's gone. Oh, never mind. I, I don't know. I have, I have not looked into that. I, I, I have. I, I, I've looked into biodynamic farming. I considered, I went down to, down to uh, Helvetia and, and looked at some farms down there. It wasn't quite my style. And so I didn't do it, but th you know, there could be something to it. There could be. And so anyway, I, I'm going to wrap that up now because I know that there's going to be some questions for all three of us. So I'll just turn it over. All right. Thank you all very much. So we're going to start uh, with our online audience and I'm going to pass it to Gwen. All right, so um, first question from online here. Are any of you panelists practicing no-till? Well, I'll, I'll say this, uh, I'm not, because I spent $10,000 on that tiller, I'm gonna use it. <laughs> but no, I, I, I'm not, because it just it wouldn't, it really wouldn't fit into my system, my rotation with all the different crop strategies that I have, it just wouldn't fit my system, I don't think. I'm letting Doug Collins do all the research and figure it all out before we try anything. Uh, nope, we're not doing no-till, but like Raleigh said, Doug has been experimenting with it on our farm and we'll adopt it when you've got it figured out. So I'll, I'll, we'll just make a couple of comments there. So yeah, we've been working on it for a while. We've done some research at Oxbow. Um, and Kearsop, we've done a lot, Organic Farm School up on Whidbey Island. We've had some epic failures at all of those places, I think, and some good successes in other places. So just over the, the eight years that we've done this, what, what seems really promising to us are the crops that kind of grow really well here anyway. So a lot of the brassicas and the cold season crops, it seems like it's not too much of a hurdle to get there. Um, we are I'm bringing Justin in on this as well. So we're actually, our next step forward is looking at winter killed um, summer cover crops and doing fall planted um, brassicas into there, both with till, full till and a no till. So a lot of it is equipment. We were able through our research to get a no till transplanter. Um, and then we've also um, have done some work with strip till, but that no till transplanter works really well. And again, I think it's the, the certain crops that grow well here anyway, they're cold season, they're, they seem to show the most promise in terms of no-till, um, you know, basically equal yields. We, we struggle with weeds. Um, the crops that are maybe a little bit more challenging to grow here, especially even north of, of where you are, Larry, it it's, gets more difficult to grow those heat-loving plants and uh, not tilling makes the soil even cooler so it you know that's another big takeaway that we learned for sure so if you're you know you're if you're not tilling you're going to lower the soil temperature that's going to make it harder for squash corn heat loving plants so that's kind of where we are and, and certainly um, looking forward uh, to doing more research in that area so aside from so this is another one from the uh, remote audience. Aside from the chicken rotation and the farming system, are any of you using additional nutrient application with commercial or organic fertilizer or compost or manure? Uh, for cover crops specifically, Diane? I'm assuming yes. But I don't have an answer from Diane quite yet. I just mean general. Yes, Diane said regarding cover crops. Yeah. Um, so we're not fertilizing um, our cover crops specifically, but we do rely on a, a feather meal 
um, uh, certified organic fertilizer that we use in conjunction with you know, our cover crops to fertilize our, our fields. Yeah, I did one caveat to my not adding any fertilizer is I've started to do more rotations where I'll grow two crops on the same bed in, in one season, an early crop and a late crop. And this year I had a lot of success with after that first crop, which didn't have any fertilizer, I would spread um, some composted chicken manure and straw that we had taken out of our um, winter barn um, to get some extra fertility when that bed's being used a second time. So I am using some um, compost that we produce on the farm from the chicken manures um, when we're using a bed more than once. Yeah, yeah. On, on the cover crop situation, I don't really add any any fertilizer or any uh, amendments at all for the cover crops. Uh, I'll look at my crops that I'm raising, and if I sense that I need to, you know, pop some nitrogen or something, I'll get some organic nitrogen and put on once in a while. But other than that, we just kind of roll with what we got, and it seems to have been working for us. Like I said, we keep a pretty strict rotation. Like for instance, on our strawberries, the typical time frame for the uh, conventional grow on strawberries is is four to five years of harvest. I go two to three and then yank it out and then and then go into some other brassicas or something like that for a while for three, four years. And I'll go back into strawberries for a couple of years. And that has seemed to work best to keep the continuity of my farm and the, and the soil and the berries of higher quality. And so that's what I do. Okay, why don't I do two more questions remotely and then we can do them here and then go back to remote because they're coming in. <laughs> so, um, with regard to winter kill cover, has anyone tried TEF? I suppose panelists or anybody in the audience? A resounding no. Okay, um, does anyone have suggestions on five or more species of cover crop cocktails? Well, like I said, uh, what, what I do quite often is I, I will mix some rye and some Austrian pea and uh, and uh, vetch. Excuse me, I, I had to think about that for a while. Vetch, and and so and then also sometimes I mean this may sound kind of ludicrous, but but I I raise a lot of sugar snap peas for the for my market and stuff like that, and particularly I raise the shorter uh, sprinters, which are much much smaller, and then also I raise some of the Oregon ones that are like six foot tall, the uh, vines are. And then when we're done with that particular one, when it starts getting the seed pods are getting hard, hard and not marketable, I let it go and let it dry off. And then I take and I use that as my nitrogen source for the next year. I just till that under. And then if some, some volunteers come back next year, that might be a field. In fact, I have a field right now. It's a half acre size where it was pea seed from last year's crop. And it's really interesting to see what that one does because it's pretty thick right now. And so. Okay, any questions from our live audience here? You mentioned pH and you didn't have to lime. Was there any specific cover crops that you grew or just the practice in general? Well, my theory about the pH is more related to the application of the chicken manure, being able to raise the pH because of the calcium content in their chicken feed. Um, so I'm not sure if the cover crop had anything to do with that. It's more a comment about the chicken manure. But Larry, you had said. Yeah, uh, I, I've done pH a few times just to check, and I'm still sitting about 6.5, and I don't really lime or anything. And I think, it, in my opinion, it has to do with more holistic approach to what I'm doing. That is, I, I raise a lot of different crops at different times on there, different years and such. And cover crop is standard on all my farm all the time. And uh, I don't worry too much about the, the, the pH, like for marion berries and stuff, because marion berries grow like a weed. And basically, I don't need to worry about that crop a whole lot. But I think like on the, my strawberry ground, since I'm pulling it out every couple of years and then rotating it into you know, three to four years of other things, I just think the diversity of what I'm adding to the soil uh, stabilizes the pH. Now, true, true, that's theory. But whenever I've tested my, tested my soil, it's been 6.5. And so, yeah, that is an interesting question. I, you know, the P, just the decomposition of organic matter will lower pH, so it's producing hydrogen ions. The, the calcium in your chicken manure is a really interesting question. I, that's something we should look at. And uh, you know, compost can be um, it can be a little on the alkaline side, so the manure and compost can you know potentially be 
kind of buffering things. I think if you're starting from a very low pH, probably some liming to get you up to a reasonable area would be good. And then um, checking that. I was just wondering, it was a question for you, if they could be adding extra buffering capacity by having more organic matter in the system. Yeah, the buffering, so I mean, the, mainly the buffering capacity, we think about um, calcium, magnesium, potassium. Uh, and, and so those would be elements that are also in the manure potentially. So, you know, and then the, I mean, I'm racking my brain, I kind of want to look into this, just the cover, like the manure kind of makes sense because you would have calcium and things like that in there. The cover crops, you know, are they mining some materials and bringing them up and potentially buffering that way? I don't know, it's, it's possible. But yeah, for, so the, the more calcium, magnesium, potassium, and even sodium you have in your soil, then those are buffering against pH. Um, this is for Raleigh and anyone else. If you've been there for five years, did you, how has, the system you just explained changed your organic material per your soil testing? Yeah, the organic matter content in our soil, I mean, I came from farming in California where organic matter levels in soil are a lot lower because it's warmer and things are degrading faster. So in Washington, organic matter percentages are a lot higher here naturally. And the field that I started with was in sod for 20 years before that. So I plowed under sod and I started with very high organic matter, not very high, but pretty high organic matter numbers to begin with. And I haven't really been raising those that much because for one thing, the chickens are eating down that cover crop a lot. So that summer cover crop of, I don't have a lot of cover crops that get to six feet tall to raise organic matter numbers. And, you know, chicken manure itself is, that's organic matter. It's a manure, you know, it's, a, it's not a green manure, it's a brown manure. So that should, our, basically the answer to your question is the organic matter numbers are holding steady. They're not really going up under my system, but they're not going down either. Um, I, I should look at a soil test. I don't remember. We're somewhere in three to five, but not super high. Okay, question from afar. Um, have any of you had issues, any of the panelists had issues with club root? And if so, how has it affected your crop rotation and your choices of cover crop? Um, I mean, we have it a little bit on our farm, um, and we just try to keep a really long rotation um, from brassica to brassica. So we are trying to stick to like a 10 year rotation before we go into um, brassica again in a field. Um, and I think that I, I, we have the space to do that, which is really nice. We didn't used to. I mean, we grow a lot of brassicas and we've cut back on what we used to be doing. Um, we try not to grow brassica cover crops as well um, because of that. That's a flea beetle issue too. Um, but that's how we deal with um, club root. I don't know if anyone else. Raleigh, your day's coming on club root. <laughs> uh, that's a great question. And, and uh, club root is prevalent in my area. Yeah, it is. Crop rotation helps tremendously on that. For instance, if I got a club root problem that it could occur in some of my brassicas and it's going to go into lettuce for a while or tomatoes or something like that for a number of years to help mitigate that. And also there's little small things you can do with your, what I have found with, with your farm. Uh, club root is a problem, but it's a much worse problem if you don't have your irrigation timing down well. By that I mean overwatering really promotes club root. And then I've got some, I've got the advantage of I can take some subsoilers that go down a minimum of three feet and I got the tractor to pull it. And if you really deeply, deeply break up that hard pan down below, that will help tremendously also on control of club root. But the main thing as far as trying to control it, which things you can do now is just watch your, do, do not overwater. It's one of those situations where you're gonna have to water more frequently and less because any puddling of the water and if you got club root in in the soil is going to be a problem for you. We've also talked a lot about not liming, but liming is another way to sort of mitigate the effects of club root and raising your pH. Sorry, I'm just going to ask a follow up on that. So in regards to the brassica cover crops, I mean, is that sort of, I know that came up earlier 
thinking about club root rotations, but do you guys have any other comments on that? Or do you see any space for brassica cover crops? I mean, I think there's, I think there's space for it for sure. I think that's an area that we need to look at and, and how to apply it appropriately on our farm. Um, it's something we're not doing, but I'm interested in it. So another question from remote in a crop, this there's a preamble to this a little bit, um, in a crop rotation involving potatoes in fine soils in the Fraser Valley in British Columbia, the potatoes tend to have some higher post harvest nitrogen levels in the fall. But potatoes are tough as the harvest is late, and so getting a cover crop planted and established as a catch crop is challenging. Any suggestions, tips, or experiences? Um, I mean, we're, we put in cover crops late too, not specifically on, it was potatoes, right? Um, but I, rye is a good one and germinates at really low temperatures and can scavenge for nitrogen. Um, and we sort of rely on that for, um, you know, buffering us from different runoffs into the rivers and waterways around us. Now, I, I know the, the, the Fraser River Valley and such, uh, they've got their own unique climate there. But in, in my climate where I farm, if on my potato ground, but it's not as big as what they're talking about there, but uh, I usually overseed with cereal rye before be actually before I start harvesting just you know one two three weeks before that and started to germinate then when you go and harvest the potatoes you're basically disturbing all their soil and you're just going to cover up the seed or the the seed just germinates just a little bit and you're already out of the gates with your cover crop already and so you narrow down the the length that you need to get it established in other words if it was me on my farm I wouldn't go out there and harvest my fall potatoes then work up the soil then plant the cover crop I'd plant the cover crop before I harvested because the harvesting mechanism, what you, whatever you do by hand or by machine, would get the seeds to germinate pretty quickly for you. So you'll gain a few weeks there. Just to comment on the, on the uh, club route, I think um, Dr. Alex Stone at OSU Corvallis has had a research program on that problem. And I suspect she's had a program for at least three years. So she should be getting some results out of that. So perhaps you could look at her website. So I have a question for uh, Larry. I wondered if you've ever used marigold as a cover crop in the matter side to biofumigant. Um, there's some, I'm always kind of amazed it's not growing in this region. Uh, there's some good results out of Australia, Africa, where it has um, good benefits on against nematodes and um, bacterial wilt. So I just wondered if you've ever grown that crop. The answer is no, but I think I'm gonna be writing down my notes to remind me of that. And so, no, I, I, I haven't, it just simply, it's not that I don't believe it works, I think it does, I just haven't done it yet is all, but I think that's a great idea. I just wonder if it'd be an interesting uh, winter kill cover crop to look at. I mean, it, it would grow in this climate um, and low input, you wouldn't need irrigation to get it growing, well, other than establishment. All right, good tip. That one way over here. As you're walking over there, I wanted to say a quick word about one item I did forget. Uh, a really good aphid control that, that nobody does, but I stumbled onto a few years ago, is thundercloud or Blairiana plum trees. They're a great catch Crop. In other words, you plant it near your field. I keep it near my, my fresh market field. I got about a dozen big trees now. Aphids, when they come in in the heat of the summer, they love, they love the thundercloud or a Blairiana plum tree a lot more than they like your vegetables. You might want to try it because I, I raise broccoli with no insecticides and I don't have an aphid problem in those fields. My question was <clears throat> along the same lines as the gentleman that just asked about marigold. I was wondering if anyone uses sun hemp, crotillaria, in this region. I know it's a tropical, subtropical cover crop, but I don't know if that's something that can be used as a winter kill or if it's something that people have tried here. I've not tried it. I'm stumped. 
I haven't, but I'm going to be doing it this season and playing with it. So I'll know more next year. Kevin, can I jump in? Can you talk more about the Sudan grass and what are your planting practices and best growing practices for it and how is it working for you? Sure, yeah, we do um, a couple things with the Sudan. We like to seed it uh, at about like 75 pounds an acre. Um, and, and we use a, a 10 foot drill and we drill the Sudan. Um, every now and then we'll mix crimson clover into that'll like grow underneath um, the Sudan too. Um, uh, we like to seed it in like June or so when it's the soil really starts, you know, warming up um, and we'll mow it regularly when it gets four to five feet tall um, and it can do that pretty quick. Um, and before it gets woody, so we want to like mow it and, and we use a brush hog. So we're sort of making windrows um, and opening out the, some light for um, a clover understory if we have any. Um, so we do that. Um, another way we use the, the Sudan grass is we've been trying to do some winter kill um, stuff with the Sudan and sowing it late. Uh, and getting it to a foot or two before winter kills and giving us a nice mulch and we've had mixed results with that um, Weeds weeds are a big issue and getting it tall enough so that it actually mulches out your soil has been tough And so I think we're still trying to knock down the date to do that um, And and I think this past year, I think we would have needed to irrigate it to get it up quicker We put it down and didn't get any rain. So that's what we're doing with it. Um, so there have been a couple of responses on some previous questions by there's a, quite a discussion going on here on on the remote <laughs> in the remote area so i thought i'd um say what some of those what some of the people say here and then um and then ask a question at the end so the question about tef as a um cover crop um the, one person answered yes yes they have experience with that tef is a nice winter killed cover in corvallis area and it breaks down pretty well for easy incorporation and planting in the spring. Um, and then um, somebody was asking uh, on here about, do you grow your own cover? Does anybody grow their own cover crop seed? And she's asking because Kursop and Nash both grow seed. And um, so I guess the question is, does anybody grow their own cover crop seed? I don't harvest my own cover crop seed, but um, the the example I gave earlier about taking over nursery and took me three years of cereal rye to get it to do anything. What I would do is I would let that go ahead and seed out and then take a big tractor in there and knock it down after the seed pods were fully formed, and let it re regrow on its own. I did that for three years in a row. So I only had the cost of the seed for one year. And that's how I solved that's what that but that's I haven't harvested any. I just let it go ahead and seed and just incorporate it back in. The problem with growing your own cover crop seed is keeping the weed seed out. You really need to clean it. So uh, you're, most people are better off buying uh, bag seed. Um, so the earlier question about um, uh, uh, cocktail um, suggestions. So um, from the Corvallis area, five-way cocktail suggestion, cereal rye, common oat, common vetch, crimson clover, and phacelia. And then let's see here, um, just a comment, light leaf spot and white leaf spot are fungal diseases that have become problematic in our brassica cover crops in the Willamette Valley. They require at least three to four year rota rotations to avoid inf infestations of other brassica crops. Sun hemp grows well in the Corvallis area, but needs quite a bit of water put on to put on a lot of biomass and nitrogen. And I uh, just wanted to point out in, in one of the handouts you have from the Corvallis um, Plant Material Center, there's um, a picture of Tef on sort of early, like the third page. And then a couple pages later, there is some sun hemp growing as well. So 
And um, those responses coming from Corvallis may be related to this data. So <laughs> thanks for sharing. Um, this is really good, uh, great work going on down there. I think I know the answer to this question already, but I, I was curious if you guys, if any of you use, uh, get additional income streams off your cover crop in any kind of way. Um, so it sounds like with Raleigh, you're, you know, grazing your, um, you pasture your chickens through there, but has anybody else experimented with either leasing ground to someone who's grazing or cutting forage, um, selling, you know, something like that? Um, and also, you know, harvesting the seed, which you already went over. Yeah, well, I mean, one nice thing about using the field peas for a winter cover crop um, when they're sown in the fall is they start making nice tendrils in the spring pretty, pretty early, like April and May. And so when I, I have to start farmer's markets in April because I have this deluge of spring eggs and I don't have a lot of vegetables at all. Um, so it's time consuming for me to go out and pick pea tendrils, but I pick them because people are just dying for greens at the farmer's market and I can sell them for a premium because they are kind of considered a fancy product. So, so I bring pea tendrils to the farmer's market from my cover crop um, when we do the field peas and it's a nice little bonus in the spring. To answer your question too, Rusty, I know that Holly Foster, who couldn't be here today, she does take hay from her, her rye fields. Uh, I was just going to mention that we actually do the same thing that Raleigh does, and we'll cut pea shoots out of our Austrian winter pea um, cover crops, and we'll just sow, you know, a block or an acre that's just the pea, and we can come in and cut it pretty well. And we we actually we've wholesaled a little bit of that, um, and we work with some food banks that purchase from us that have, you know, clients that are used to eating that um, from the different places that they're from. And so they, that's been really popular for us in that early, early springtime before we really flush out our crop mix. Well, I have the microphone, so I'm gonna talk. <laughs> so um, I don't know if anyone's worked with sunflowers before, but one year I had a whole bunch of sunflower seed for free and that made a good winter kill. I think we were too early with it because it was really, really stemmy and some of them had gone to, to seed and then we had to kill extra sunflower seeds the next year. But I feel like that has promise as a winter kill and I don't know if anyone has dialed that in. I'd love to hear about it because I thought they were a fun plant. And I also, I've never worked with, this is my question, never worked with annual ryegrass and I wanna know what the dangers are in terms of it spreading or going to seed or being a problem. So I don't know if you guys have run into problems with annual ryegrass before. Sly Raleigh. <laughs> now, I, I assume you, I assume you mean the annual rye that grows about six inches tall, something like that. I've never had any issues with it because by the time I get in there and start turning it under, it's never really done anything. In fact, I've really enjoyed it because it's compared to a lot of the cover crops, the root system of that is very fibrous, shallow, but very fibrous. And so, boy, when I work that soil up, the soil would just fall apart off the roots. It would die and would plant right into it. And so I've had nothing but success with it. The, the, biggest, the biggest problem I got with it is twofold. One is I got to seed it by hand. I don't have the equipment because the seed is so darn small. And secondly, it's not cheap. And so that's only, but, but it's worth it. You know, particularly on what, like I said, you, you, you heard what I use it for, for the, the peppers and tomatoes. It works great. Yeah, it seems to set seed really late. Like it's not something you're going to miss, I don't think. Oh, I just had a follow-up comment on the pea shoots. I was glad to hear that because there's a WSU pea shoots publication and we actually added that aspect into it this year. So there's a little bit of technical information on how you might go about doing that and what you might expect for anybody else that's interested in it. And Rusty, I just remembered at the farm I worked on in California that grew wheat for harvest. They would put their sheep on the wheat when after it had gotten the you know, to knee high or whatever, and they let the sheep nibble it down, and then it would regrow going into the winter, and they would harvest it later. So yeah, I think that's a common practice. I've got a quick thought on the sunflowers as well. I haven't done this, but a friend of mine um, who farms down in Arkansas has, and he's actually 
seeded out fields of sunflowers and then he's into the agro-tourism thing and he charges a fee to take prom pictures and like wedding pictures and stuff in front of those, those, those fields. And he's had a ton of success with it and does it year after year after year. Um, so a thought if you want to take that angle. Okay, question from afar. Um, what are the cold season crops that respond well to no-till? We have um, used broccoli and kale, but I'm, I'm just sort of basing that. And so like when we do our research, we don't tend to see a difference in yield based on um, the tillage that we're doing with broccoli and kale. Uh, we could still at the same time, you know, see more weed pressure, but that the, the lack of a difference in yield and plants that look very healthy is pretty cool to me because you're just, you know, with this no-till transplanter, just barely opening up the soil and dropping a transplant in there. And those roots are able to get into that soil and, and grow well without, you know, all the tillage. So um, simultaneously, we would be monitoring temperature and seeing that the temperature in those um, no-till areas is much lower or significantly lower than it is where we have done full tillage. So um, contrast that with squash, which is probably the, we've done squash and corn um, and we, we do tend to see a yield decrease in the squash. And I would say that's probably due to that reduction in soil temperature and maybe weed pressure as well. But so I haven't tried every cold season crop, but we've tried broccoli and kale numerous times. So this is a comment by, um, so King Conservation District has a no-till a, a no drill available through a loan program. I know Pierce Conservation does, District does as well. So that's more of a comment that, and I don't know, Renee, if you want to talk about the no-till drill loan at all. Do you want to? Okay. Or Allie. So thanks to the Ag COI, we were able to obtain a no-till drill. It's a Land Pride 606 NT. So um, last year was our kickoff year, and most of our users, I think 10 of the 12 users, had pastures, but we did use it for a couple of cropping systems. And it's available again this year at no charge, no charge. Um, we will only charge you if you reserve it and it comes to your farm and then you don't use it because you've taken up that time from somebody else. But we are, it lives at Jennings Equipment and we are paying the hauling fee for it to come to your farms if you're in Pierce County. So definitely please take advantage of that program. And we're doing a lot of uh, trials with WSU on pasture systems, uh, seeding with it and also on some cropping systems. So King Conservation District also has a no-till drill. The best information is on our website. Go to the home page, scroll all the way to the bottom, click on the link for no-till drill. We have a little different fee structure. Um, we're hopefully going to offer a training this year, um, but you basically need to have a online or a phone consultation with a resource planner before it comes out. Our fee structure is a little bit different, but um, I don't have all the details in my head, but it is available and it, it's been used successfully and hopefully we'll be doing a farm tour at a cooperator. One of our board members this year has used it a couple of times, so stay tuned for that. Yeah, let me add that we are going to have some trainings as part of our uh, trials workshops. Um, the Using it on crop applications is going to be in April. We don't have the date set yet. And then we're going to do a pasture renovation training at the workshop that's happening in May. Same thing. We don't have the date for it yet. But keep an eye out on our website. And same situation. You have to either attend a training in person or take it online and pass a test before you use the equipment. Is that drill av available in Pierce County only and is yours? 
only King County and only Pierce County for their respective drills. San Juan County has one as well. Um, Lewis Conservation District also has a no-till drill and it's housed at Valley Agronomics in Jehalis, so that's open to the public. So just another option that's not county specific. Cool. All right, yeah, we do have a um, trial going on at Bright Eyes on pasture renovation. So look forward to that field day. We did um, experiment out there. And then um, also at the four elements, we did a experiment there where we planted. So at Bright Eyes, we did pasture planting with different levels of tillage. And at four elements, we just did sort of a demonstration pass with cover crop planting. Um, and I think that, you know, I think there's potential uh, for cover crop planting, especially in clean fields. Like I, I like how Raleigh said he's been farming his field, his farm for five years. He's starting to get on top of the weeds. So, you know, if you're in an organic system and you're trying to go from one crop to another crop and there's no tillage in between, um, you know, you really have to be on top of the weeds. But I, I think there is potential for um, a no-till drill for, for cover crop applications or just going from that one crop to another, or maybe some light disturbance. And that's another area where we're real interested in, in, in terms of the reduced tillage. Can we do sort of some light disturbance and then come through with the right implement um, and plant that? But we've also heard that some, you know, some crops will germinate with, with very little disturbance, but those drills are really good at sort of cutting through whatever trash is left and, and getting that seed to soil contact. Just curious if you have looked into um, like other like non-tractor implement methods of breaking down cover crops or helping to break them down like solarization or occultation or other things like that. I haven't, but that's a great question. Have Raleigh, have you done some occultation? Uh, yeah, I haven't right? done that much with the <laughs> occultation, just a little bit, mostly for weed control, but not for, I know that's a lot of the smaller scale growers are doing it. I yeah, I mean, we've, we've looked, I'm very intrigued by it. I, I guess all the plastic kind of worries me a little bit and, and the scalability, but um, it's possible. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd like to pursue more sort of research at, at, at different scales, but um, I, I know a lot of people swear by it, you know, and, and I think in terms of when you're thinking about the no-till, you know, weeds, weeds are our biggest implement and there's, there's a lot of promise obviously with the oculation application ground coverage smothering <laughs> um. i've used it on a smaller scale other than oxbow to you know flip beds that are planted into salad mixes and things like that not specifically a cover crop but i mean what's the difference um and like mowing it and covering it up and you know if it's not too woody and it's a nice lush crop you can break it down pretty easily with those salvage types. I had a question um, about uh, I'm really interested in hearing more about berries uh, not having to fumigate with the berries because we have a lot of berry growers here and I'd like to hear more about that to be able to pass that information on. Okay, so the question about fumigation versus berry crops. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't fumigate anything. I just shorten my rotation down quite a bit because uh, the pathogens that are in the soil, usually the life cycles, it, I don't let them get built up. So I, but I have the advantage of doing that because I get a higher return per acre than uh, processor growers get. Um, and so I just take the field out every two years. What I have found is that's the rotation I need to be in to uh, not use any fumigation on my on my property. So I just rotate it out. I try to keep it out three to five years into something else before I go back into the strawberries, for instance, and uh, just cut that cycle out. And so we never get a buildup. You know, you never want to see your soil, in my opinion, get to a threshold of you've got to use a chemical. So you just got to be diligent and keep the rotation pattern that works for your climate, your soil, and your operation. Yeah, I use a lot of cereal rye for the first three years right after I pull my strawberries out, for instance. I, it just seems to work better for me. Then I'll go into some vegetables and some other cover crops. And then I'll, depending on the market and how many berries I got, 
you know, on board already, then I'll probably go back into the strawberries for another two, two years. So, okay. So there's one more comment here about um, a winter cover crop mix. Sorry, these are out of order, but <laughs> um, this person, Drew Yates, has seen sunflower as part of a winter cover crop mix, a cocktail mix in the Fraser Valley. Anecdotally, it appears to winter kill very well. It definitely seems to function most, mostly as a PR component to the seed mix. I did want to fall. I forgot about the annual ryegrass. Um, Larry was talking about peas being popular to the geese. The annual ryegrass geese love too a lot. So I, I don't have a solution to that. That's been my biggest problem is I'm just basically creating really good grazing pasture. And I'm curious if anybody has any foolproof methods for getting rid of geese that don't involve shooting them. Yeah, instead of using Austrian field pea, use uh, an Athilla leaf type field pea. And um, they grow more erect and uh, no animal will pa can pass through that. Um, it, all the tendrils interlock. So um, that's the, the pea cover crop that I recommend rather than Austrian field pea. A lot less disease resistant, uh, disease susceptibility and then a quick comment on the sunflower, just watch for sclerotinia, uh, white mold. Yeah, we had to fence our, our cover crop trial the year before last because of previous geese predation. And, um, and then I noticed with the trial we did at Oxbow, it seemed like they really went after the winter wheat, if I remember correctly. I was out there looking at stuff and <laughs> <laughs> the, the cereal rye was nice and tall and the winter wheat had just been kind of mowed over. So uh, for us, they really went after our vetch one year and not our rye. I don't know. It, it's a problem we, we deal with. But we have, we have gone to great fencing extremes when we didn't want to lose a trial. Another one online? So a response to I think this conversation was that green lasers are working reportedly working well on Lopez Island. You have to keep at it until they give up. Does that make I'm not sure. Is it green lasers for geese? Maybe some Bruce, can you clarify that a little bit? Yep. Green lasers for geese. <laughs> I learned something. Question for Raleigh. Do you have any predation issues with your chickens from um, raptors? Oh, from or raptors, yeah. And, and so, how do you deal with it? Yeah, so real quickly, um, we have lots of coyotes in the neighborhood that um, hunt for, for rodents right out in the field um, where the chickens are. And the electric fence is fine for the, they don't jump over it for some reason. Their instinct is to burrow under it and they get zapped in the nose. So we have no trouble with the coyotes. And uh, with raptors, I've only, I really can say this, we've only lost <laughs> one confirmed chicken to a raptor. We have bald eagles that live just mm -hmm. next to our property. Um, I think the main reason is that um, we have so many chickens that they're loud and they're intimidating in numbers. So I know that a lot of people have smaller flocks, get their chickens picked off all the time, but I have, I have such a large number of chickens in one space making a lot of noise and racket that it's actually intimidating to a raptor. The other thing is I, I would, you would steer clear from having your chickens right underneath um, a tree that has a branch, you know, maybe a dead tree would be really bad because the raptor can sit on that dead tree, look down in, at the chickens and think about it all day. And then they might get up the courage to go down, swoop down. Um, so having them in the open pasture helps, just having them in a wide open pasture. And I do keep a couple roosters and they do tend to look towards the sky a little bit more and they will alert the flock. So I think it's good to have a few roosters. Yeah. And they're big and intimidating, I think too. Especially the one we named Bouncer. Um, we couple... pardoned him, he got so big, we kept him around. <laughs> a couple of you mentioned using Phacelia in your cover crop mixes. But one thing that I was told from some farmers down in California is that it 
over winters brown marmorated stink bugs, which are becoming more and more of a problem up here. I don't know if anybody's heard about that or if you guys have seen any problems with that on your farms. Interesting question. Anyone? I haven't noticed it. You know, I would wonder, I haven't noticed it either, but if it's an issue in California, I wonder if it's more weather dependent as to the survival of the stink bug is just more prevalent there, you know. Oh, we got someone that knows what he's doing. Um, in Pierce County and several other counties, it's confirmed that we have brown marmor marmorated stink bug. Um, I don't know how, what, if they go to East Coast levels where they're in the billions, I don't know. But in general, with invasive weeds, insects, these sort of things, I think it's true that in general, it takes a decade or so. Even before it's located in a given county, it's there, it's been there for a while. And then maybe 10 years later, if there's a real bad downside, it happens then. So I think it's too early to really tell whether, what the, how we're favoring it, maybe with overwintering facility or whatever. Um, so I think we should, should watch for both mount brown marmorated stink bug. I don't, we should not count it out for surviving well this, these winters. That's my opinion. I don't know how relevant this is, but at Oxbow, you mentioned you have a native plant nursery and are cover crops at all used related to that part of your operation? Um, cover cropping, not directly. Um, one thing we do do in relation to the native plant nursery, and this isn't my area of expertise, but the team that operates it, you know, forages and collects seeds from our property. Um, so that makes the farm, uh, you know, have to consider what we're planting and make sure that we're not planting a non-native species of something that they might be collecting, like a lupin or something like that. Um, so that, you know, is something we keep in the back of our head when we're planting um, different crops. Um, we're, you know, we're talking about looking at, um, native pasture species and trying to develop some native pasture land uh, at Oxbow that we can then uh, collect seed from. Um, and, you know, in theory, that could be a, a, like a perennial cover crop or something that works into our system. But right now, no. While he's walking over there, the, to back to the facilia, it, it, it's a tricky one because I think it is a concern for um, creating a, a weed seed problem. If it does, it can go to seed pretty quickly. And if it doesn't winter kill, you could have a problem. So I think we need more people trying it out to see if it always winter kills in our environment. And anecdotally, it seems like for better winter kill, you want the crop to get to full size and then it'll winter kill easier when that hard frost comes. If it's still growing and that smaller stage, it's going to actually be more frost resistant. Isn't that right? Yeah. Midland, uh, Midland Puyallup. Yeah. Uh, That's what I've noticed too. The, the, the oh, yeah. Uh, for me in a Midland area, Puyallup, Washington, the phacelia that was only, that had grown and sh shed seeds and started growing again, about three to five inches tall, is in masses and has not winter killed at all. I know it's been a mild winter, but it has done just fine. Whereas I suspect most of my bigger plants have died by now. Some of them have. Yeah, the online comment is that Fasilia usually overwinters in the fall, planted in September and October. Yeah, so get it in earlier if you want it to winter kill. Yeah, we have not experimented with it. Yeah, and, and what we do, and we have good 
luck with it winter killing, but we'll direct seed it when we plant our kale and brassicas. So we're putting it in, you know, July at the latest normally. I just wanted to know if um, you all have tried um, more with other clovers besides the white clovers and what you think the potential is there. And I was hoping maybe Justin could talk a little bit more about his clover work as well. I think you've been doing some clover work. Yeah. Uh, we use crimson clover, so that's you know another option besides the white. Um, so I think what you're referring to is uh, putting clover underneath buckwheat. Is that is that the one? Yeah, uh, one of the nice aspects about clover is it's shade tolerant. Um, it's one reason why it, well, it's related to one reason why it doesn't establish very well and become weed competitive right away. So it really could, it really is aided by a nurse crop. And um, so we've we've used all kinds of different nurse crops to to help nurse in clover while it's establishing. Um, and then that can either be mowed off or harvested off, whatever the nurse crop is, and then allow the clover to take over after it's already become, you know, to a point where it's competitive. Yeah, and this past summer we did it with buckwheat. I did it once in New York too, but uh, most commonly with, with uh, different kinds of cereal grains. Yeah. Someone earlier, one, one of the growers mentioned doing that too. Okay, any of any more questions that are just sort of burning and you wanted to wondered whether you should ask them. All right, good. We got them. <laughs> Hold on. I don't know how to use a microphone. Am I close enough? Okay. Uh, I have three and a half acres that we just planted 75 chestnut trees into. It's newly cleared land and we want to cover crop it so that we have some nutrition going into the soil. It's very sandy. Um, we have future plans of intercropping fruit or more nuts in there. Uh, that said, what would you guys do with three and a half acres of bare land? Maybe Ali wants to answer this one. <laughs> Oh, Allie didn't hear the question. Okay, the, Allie, the question is newly planted chestnuts and uh, what cover crop would you recommend planting sort of in the alleys? Um, there's a few fun publications in your resource list um, as, a, as a good starting point. Um, and then I know that the folks down at OSU are been, have been working with what to grow in hazelnuts. And I think there's still, I, I heard that there was a, a great workshop done there this past summer and they've determined all the things not to do. And so I think they're trying to figure out still what, what works for hazelnut at least. And I imagine that there'd be a lot of crossover with chestnut. Yeah, Nick Wyman at Oregon State University put on that workshop and I think he's working in that. Great question though. I, the tour we did down in Oregon, it was mind blowing. The just like, it looks like those trees are growing in pavement, how clear they keep you know, the ground under all those trees. So good for you for <laughs> doing something other than that. Um, another? Okay, now in, in my area, hazelnuts, they're, they're pretty much picked by machine. So they got to keep it pretty much cement. Right. And so, it, uh, but you've been thinking about that. Are you going to? Oh, okay. Hold on. Um, we have been thinking about it. We're not planning to, uh, so the whole point of these chestnut trees is for hardwood production um, predominantly, but we will have chestnuts in the meantime and we're going to have to figure out what the heck to do. But our initial plan at this rate is fence it for five years till they're tall enough to be out of elk browse and then invite the elk in and have a food plot um, for <laughs> our own harvesting. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know. They're on 40 foot centers. They're very 
far apart spacing. So we have room to do a lot. We just haven't decided exactly what we're going to do yet. Um, and we're kind of open to any ideas that anyone has. It's just an experiment. Oh, I think that's pretty exciting myself. I mean, I, I think at 40 foot centers, you've got a lot of options in there. We have a brush mower and um, a box blade, and that's pretty much all of the equipment that we have currently and don't really want to invest in more if we don't have to. So that's another sort of part of the equation. What's easiest to mm-hmm. knock down without a tiller, that sort of stuff. Well, I, you know, yeah. Subterranean clover. (laughs) I wanted to highlight that the issue of Wild Garden Seed Catalog, you might have just gotten in the mail, has an ode to chickweed as a cover crop from Sir Albert Howard in there. So. (laughs) Okay, well, let's give these guys a big hand. That was awesome. And I think that will wrap up our workshop. So thank you all for joining, joining us in the webinar. And we will hopefully see you again next year Wild or sometime soon. Here, Thanks. Somebody posted it on Instagram. Here's the, here's the story. Yeah. I know they sell chickweed. They actually sell chickweed? Yeah. 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 Wild Garden Seed, they're in Paloma. Outside of Corvallis, yeah. yeah. They're, uh, they were always connected to what gathering together farm. Oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah.